Hi, my name is Rachel, and today we're going to talk about Iron Flame, the sequel to Fourth Wing, the second book in the Imperium series. 100 pages longer than Fourth Wing. For why? When we last left our main character, Violet Sorengale, she had just learned, dis just, just learned, despite incredible amounts of glaringly obvious signs, that the government she serves is evil. They've been hiding the existence of Venon and Wyvern while demonizing the Griffin people. They sent a bunch of their writers, including Violet, into battle. Battle happened people die. Violet gets taken to Orisha, which is the home of the Rebellion, Sea Rebellion, and learns that her brother Brennan isn't actually dead, despite being not around the last six years. He's been secretly hiding, co-leading the revolution with Violet's boyfriend, Zayden Ryerson, the son of the original Rebellion leader. And her dragons knew, but didn't tell her. And her not-dead brother magically healed her from an attack by the Venon, where she got poisoned. The end. Now, here we are, Iron Flame. In this review, I'm gonna do my best to pronounce the terms and names that Rebecca wrote according to how they're supposed to be pronounced in Scottish Gaelic. I learned from Murin on TikTok who's giving a rundown of correct pronunciation who also talked about the fact that the author was told hey you're conflating Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic which are different. The author has since said that she plans to get a Scottish Gaelic tutor and I hope that she does. Learning languages that we use like this is important and language being taken away is even discussed in this book so if we're going to use it we should learn it. I've personally been learning the language of Portuguese using Babel. Hola, meu nome é Rachel e hoje estamos falando sobre Iron Flame. I don't think I should translate the book title. Hi, my name's Rachel and today we're talking about Iron Flame. <laughs> Babel is one of the top language learning apps in the world and it has lessons using real life conversations that are scientifically proven to help you start learning a new language in just three weeks. The lessons were designed by real teachers and I found that Babel has been really helpful in helping me to acquire knowledge about particularly Thing, things that can be hard about learning a new language like sentence structure and verbs. Portuguese verbs. Oh my goodness. They also have a great review section so that you can go back over everything that you've learned in a variety of ways, which really helps me retain better what I've learned. The review section is listening, speaking, writing, and flashcards. Babbel teaches you language in a practical way so it prepares you to have conversations about everything from travel to business to books and personal stuff. Like for instance, Lou might text me and say, what time's your doctor's appointment tomorrow? A que horas? At what time? And I might answer, Amanya al meal dia de mea. Tomorrow at half past 12. One of my goals for this year is to get to Belo Horizonte in Brazil to visit my best friend Lou and be able to buy a book in Portuguese and be able to read it. If you're hoping to learn a new language this year, be it Portuguese or Turkish or Italian or Indonesian, you can get 60% off your subscription during Babbel's spring sale, which is going on now. Just click the link below or use the QR code to get started today. And thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring today's video. So we start out right where we left off, like immediately. There is no time between. And it says, Iron Flame is a non-stop thrilling adventure fantasy set in the brutal and competitive world of a military college for dragon riders, which includes elements regarding war, psychological and physical torture, imprisonment, intense violence, brutal injuries, perilous situations, blood, dismemberment, burning, murder, death, animal death, graphic language, loss of family, grief, and sexual activities that are shown on page. Readers who may be sensitive to these elements, please take note and prepare to join the revolution. It feels like when you're about to go on a ride. Please remain seated and keep your arms and legs at all times. Again, I feel like that's how we started off the last time. So those are your trigger warnings. And it says again, the following text has been faithfully transcribed from Navarian into the modern language by Jacinia Nilewart, curator of the Scribe Quadrant at Basgeath War, War College. All events are true and names have been preserved to honor the courage of those fallen. May their souls be commended to Malik. Once again, I am just asking why Jacinia translated Violet's diary because this is written in first. Another entrance part in this, the six. 28th year of our unification, it is hereby recorded that Arisha has been burned by dragon in accordance with the treaty, ending the separatist movement, which was Zayden's father's rebellion. Those who fled survived, and those who did not entombed in her ruins. And this was a public notice transcribed by Cyrilla Nilewort, who must be related to Jacinia Nilewort. And this book starts out saying, revolution tastes oddly sweet. I already want to quit. She gives you the information on what previously happened by way of Violet explaining what happened to her. 
summer but in the most like violet is obviously a millennial way haven't eaten in three days since a not so mythological being stabbed I I'm already laughing <laughs> since a not so mythological being stabbed me in the side with a poison blade that should have killed me yes what a bummer and in walks her brother this might go down as the most surreal experience of my life Brennan is alive then in dark wielders I thought only existed in fables are real and I'm like but it was just so obvious and then we do that thing where we end after every word with a period Brennan is alive and he is making sure she's eating breakfast because brotherly bonding and he's like the biscuits are good right the revolution biscuits they're delicious oddly sweet she's like oh him making me eat before he takes me to my dragons is the most Brennan move ever it would have been nice to like know more about Brennan by establishing more about him in the last book but she never thinks about her dead brother not dead brother oh well and her birthday passed while she was asleep knocked out from venom poison and he says you're welcome by the way for the mending consider it a 21st birthday present Bodhi walks in is that Zayden's cousin or is Garrick Zayden's cousin which one is Zayden's cousin I want to say Bodhi who cares and he refers to Brennan as Lieutenant Colonel Ashery which is this word right here which in the Gaelic tr it's translated from Gaelic to mean resurrection so really on the nose there <laughs> and he says I had to change my last name for obvious reasons and I'm like what do you mean don't doesn't everybody know who you are do you go places what do you need a last name for well you got me by all accounts, it doesn't make sense. And they are in Arisha, which is Zayden's home, his original home. That's where Brennan's living. That's where the revolution is hanging out. And Arisha was supposed to have been burned, but apparently it's not burned. And I honestly am kind of confused by this because I feel like wouldn't the Empire like want to, I don't know, is it, is it a religious thing that they don't go back or wouldn't the Empire, I don't know, wouldn't the Empire want that land for something? Y'all didn't check to make sure you got rid of the revolution for sure. And she's like, the thick stone walls are what saved it from its supposed demise six years ago. The the whole army, the whole army full of people who are a lot older and smarter than you didn't didn't think that maybe that would have been the case. Okay, so basically the revolution has been slowly and quietly rebuilding under the empire's nose. And General Melgren, who's like the big evil guy in the military who has a big black dragon, is supposed to be able to see the outcome of any battle. What does this mean exactly? I don't know. What constitutes a battle in particular? I don't know. It's not really explained. So anything could be a battle. A conspiracy could be a battle. I'm not really sure. But if the marked children, who are the children of of the rebellion leaders who have a mark on them to mark them as a rebellion leader's child. Wow, that sentence got away from me. If they are together in groups of three or more, General Melgren cannot see what they're doing. But is everything they're doing a battle? But they're not allowed to hang out in, together in groups of three or more, but they are. So he's never been able to see them organizing to fight here. But wouldn't that be organizing and not a battle in and of itself? So he, can he see anything that anybody's doing that might lead to a battle? Is that it? Genuine questions. And of course, we take time to note that Imogen, our pink haired friend, has had time at the rebellion leader underground house to um, recently dye her hair a brighter pink, which I don't know why I need that information. Violet and the rest of the kiddos go and sneak and listen to Brennan having a meeting with Zayden and the other rebellion leaders, most of whom are like, you know, adults, which technically so is Zayden and Brennan. Anyways, and of course, we take this moment to describe how Zayden's looking because if there's anything I want to know from this situation is how hot is Zayden? We're talking amongst the rebellion leaders, the rebellion that we just found out existed still, of which her brother, who she thought was dead for six years, and that kind of, you know, emotionally upended her life. All of that, it's not the priority right now. The priority is we need to know exactly how hot Zayden Ryerson is. He looks good, even with bruises marring the tawny brown skin under his eyes from lack of sleep, the high slope of his cheeks, the dark eyes that usually soften whenever they meet mine, the scar that bisects his brow and ends beneath his eye, the swirling, shimmering relic that ends at his jaw, and the carved lines of the mouth I know as well as my own, all add up to make him physically fucking perfect to me. And that's just his face. His body? Somehow even better. And the way he uses it when he has me in his arms? No. I shake my head and cut my thoughts off right there. Cut it off right there? Ma'am, that was several sentences long. Zayden may be gorgeous and powerful and terrifyingly lethal, which shouldn't be the turn on it is, but I can't trust him to tell me the truth about, well, anything, which really hurts considering how pathetically in love I am with him. 
thank you so much for that information. That was really important. So they start talking about stuff that's going to be really important in this book, but it's extremely confusing because in order to fight the Venom and the Wyvern, they need a luminary and a ward and also an alloy. And I'm not really sure how all of these things work together or what any of them are, despite reading this twice now. So one of the council members says, we're still short a luminary if you haven't noticed. And another says, and where are we in negotiations for Viscount Tecaris for his? Zayden says, that man only collects things, he doesn't trade them. And Violet notes that Viscount Tecaris isn't a noble family in Navarian records, and we don't even have Viscounts in our aristocracy. Now, I want you to remember that because she does not ask about this man for the rest of the time. She begs to be let in on information, but she doesn't ask basic questions about stuff she learns right now. It is so stupid. Apparently, Zayden doesn't want to make some sort of undisclosed trade with Viscount Tecaris and says he can fuck off with his offer. Viscount Tecaris doesn't want to give up his luminary. Why they don't just make plans to steal it is beyond me. Who this man is beyond me. Now, we're only reading up to 22 chapters in this video. This is going to be a three-part series again, but yes, that means that up to chapter, at the end of chapter 22, Viscount Tecaris has not come back up again since chapter one. What a great rebellion we're having. She noticed that Zayden commands a bunch of respect at this assembly, so understandably Zayden is pretty in charge here. She's like, I bet Zayden is the most powerful person in this room given their silence. About that, how does that work? Why is he the most powerful person in this room? What about shadows is more powerful than other people's power? And they say that they have about a year before the wards are going to fall, the venom and the wyvern are going to show up and they're going to take over and sap the magic from the land and kill everybody. And apparently the revolution is the only one that's fighting this because the empire thinks that they have it under control or some shit. And here it says, Zayden shoots my brother a look that I can't decipher and I breathe deeply as it hits me. He probably knows my brother better than I do and he kept him from me. Of all the secrets he hid, that's one I can't quite swallow. Now I want you to remember that because at no point does Violet ask, hey Brennan, what happened to you? How did you fake your death? Up to at least chapter 22. And we do a lot in this book. It's 640 pages. Why would we not ask? Why? And Taryn says, what would you have done with the information had he shared it? Tiern is her dragon. And Violet says, stop bringing logic into an emotional argument. You are supposed to be a book smart person. Okay. And then we ruminate a little bit on the fact that Liam, her friend, and Jay, his dragon, they died because Jay got attacked by a wyvern and Jay died. And in response to that, Liam died because if a dragon dies, the writer dies. They ruminate on whether or not Violet should be kept as a prisoner or released back to go. And Brennan's like, well, you trust me. And they're like, yeah, well, you've proven your loyalty. And so once again, I'm wondering, then why did Brennan change his last name again? So Brennan says, knowing that she's bought into Tiern, whose bonds get deeper with each writer and whose previous bond was already so strong that Nowlin's death nearly killed him, knowing we fear he'll die if she does now. And because of that, Ryerson's life is tied to hers. And Zayden says, I alone am responsible for Violet. And if I'm not enough, there are not one, but two dragons already vouched for her integrity. And I'm like, then why are we even here? If the dragons vouched for the integrity, then why are we even here? This is just all to be dramatic. Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. This is wasting my time. And Violet says, she is standing right here. So stop talking about me and try talking to me. And I'm like, you have never sounded like more of a teenager. Great. She's like, I kept every secret. And they're like, well, you ended up in Athbean because Dane stole the information from your memory. And Zayden's like, well, that's not her fault. Everybody hates Dane. Dane sucks. Dane's a memory stealer. It's all Dane's fault. Well, then he says, no first year could withstand a memory reader. And I'm like, wait, hold on, hold on. Is this implying that people who aren't first years can beat Dane? Do we have regular like people training against people getting in their heads? And if so, then why are the intrinsics a threat if people can learn to tune them out? And also if people who are not first years are training regularly to keep mind readers out of their head, then how is Dane's power valuable at the college for anybody who isn't a first year? So then it's now that they all adjourn this meeting and she's like, I want to talk to my brother Brett who I have not spoken to and I have six years of questions for. Does she ask all those questions? No, she does not. Does she ask any of those questions up to chapter 22? She does not. It's great. Chapter two. It is the valley above Ryerson House healed by a natural thermal energy that is its greatest asset. For there lie the original ha ha gra ha hatching grounds of the Dumadi line from which two of the greatest dragons of our line, of our line, Koda and Tiern, descend. And she's like, so this is where you've been the last six years? And we were just 
just talking to you didn't why didn't you ask this earlier I don't get it and he's like the relief when I found out that you survived threshing at the Bas Basgath war, war College is indescribable and she's like you knew and you know what same question but if you think that he's gonna explain how he knows the answer is no how exactly are you alive Brennan where is your dragon what are you doing here why didn't you come home these are all good questions one at a time he says but then he doesn't answer and instead we switch to him saying Naolin was Tyrion's previous rider so her black dragon was previously ridden by Brennan's friend and Brennan's friend saw him dying and siphoned the dying away from Brennan and Naolin died so in her head Violet says to Tyrion her dragon I'm sorry your rider died saving my brother and he says we will no longer speak of the one who came before why because you could have just told her what happened and then she would have been on your side with the resistance this entire time okay Brennan does give her one answer there are other dragons here and they saved us hit us in the network of caves within the valley and then later th with the civilians who survived the city being scor scorched and she asks where his dragon is now and he says he's been in the valley with the others for days keeping watch on your and Darna with Tarn scale and since you woke up Ryerson and he explains why he's here but not how how the fuck did you fake your death where was your body what did they burn I'm here for the same reason you fought at Resin because I can't stand by safely behind the barriers of Navari's wards and watch innocent people die at the hands of dark wielders because our leadership is too selfish to help that's also the reason I didn't come home I couldn't fly for Navarre you know, knowing what I'd done what we're doing and I sure as hell couldn't look our mother in the eye and listen to her justify our cowardice I refuse to live the lie and she's like oh but you left me and Mira to live it which you know what fair that's fair I would be mad if my brother did this to me too so she asks him what about the wyvern he says we've known about them for a few months but none of the cadets which is Ryerson and company the ones that are enrolled at Basgiath until now we've limited what Ryerson and the others have known for their own safety which might have been a mistake oh you don't say we know that they have at least two breeds of wyvern one that produces blue fire and a faster one that gre breeds green fire she asks how many how, how are they making them and he's like what do you mean making don't you mean hatching them and she says no no, making. Don't you remember the fables that dad used to read to us? They said that wyvern are created by venom. They channel power into wyvern. I think that's why riderless ones die when I killed their dark wielders. Their source of power was gone. How convenient, first of all, that the resistance, who includes her brother, who was raised by the exact same man, conveniently is clueless to ev all of this until this woman appears. Now, if her dad had started turning towards the resistance and only read those fables to Violet, sure, that sort of makes more sense and then at this is the point where I would say wait if dad was reading me fables that are now banned which she found out in the last book that they, they they're gone they don't exist anywhere in the archives which means somebody's suppressing the information then dad might have known something why don't we look into dad's writings instead both of these siblings come from the same stupidity tree and they don't think to do that very basic idea because apparently this revolution is a circus and she's like are you telling me that you not only didn't know they're created but have no idea where they're coming from and he says that's accurate and she says how comforting it's not comforting it's convenient it's convenience it doesn't make sense is what it is like let's not just speed past this how is this possible they've had time to create an assembly full of people who decide whether or not Violet should stay or go they hide dragons in networks of tunnels they create a spy network that obviously reports back to Brennan that's how she he knew that she met she passed threshing they link up with griffin riders to get the griffins weapons they fake deaths but they don't know anything about about the enemy they're fighting please they only the, like the strategy here is to only give them very basic information so that all of the holes in their information can be filled by Violet which is a cheap way to make Violet look smart and Brennan thinks that they have about six months until the Wyvern and Venon go up this river and are strong enough to come for Navarre and they talk about the iron box that they found at Resin where they bought the Wyvern who were there to get that box the Wyvern and the Venon god I don't even I don't even remember which is which and apparently it's some kind of lure but but they had to destroy it before we could fully investigate how convenient and another box was already found like it before already smashed but the crap the craftsmanship is navari and meaning navari is creating lures to bring the wyvern and venon to them for some reason she asked do you think that navari will come for do you think that the wyvern and venon will come for navari before they take the rest of Romeo, which is where the griffin riders live why not take out the easier targets first and he says to her their survival depends on coming for 
for Navare, as much as ours depends on stopping them. The energy in the hatching grounds at Basgia could keep them fed for decades, because again, these people rip power from the ground. And yet, Melgren thinks the wards are so infallible that he won't alert the population, or he's afraid that telling the public will make them realize we aren't entirely the good guys, not anymore. Wait, so you just found out that Wyvern exists, yet somehow you've already confirmed that this is General Melgren's thought process? But how? They talk about how sometime in the past, Navarians of some generation must have wiped the history books, erasing the existence of Venon from common education, all because we aren't willing to risk our own safety by providing the one material that can kill dark wielders, the same alloy that powers the farthest reaches of our wards. So again, there's that alloy that they put into weapons that kill the Venon, and also that alloy powers the wards that keep the Venon out. And she says, Dad always tried to tell us. He tried to tell you, but he didn't talk to his wife about this? Why was he putting this on his kids, but not explicitly saying it? And how did he know? What, his best plan was to hint at his kids? Seriously? She asked, do you think dad knew? Because the idea of him structuring my entire existence around facts and knowledge only to withhold the most important part of it is unfathomable. And Brennan says, I choose to believe he didn't. Then why was he acquiring all this information? Why was he reading you guys fairy tales about the venom? Are you saying that he didn't know about the venom then? Then why hide the book that no one else knows exists and doesn't uh, have a copy in the archives? Why would he not have handed over his info on golden dragons if he didn't suspect that the government was corrupt? Why am I, the reader, asking these very basic questions instead of this man's children? And she says to him, you called it a revolution, not a rebellion. Tyrish isn't the only thing dad taught us both. They speak Tyrish. You think you can win, unlike Fen Ryerson, Zayden's dad. She gives him some more information about the Venon, how one of them said that they had a sage, like a teacher. And again, I'm just wondering how the fuck is it possible that this man who's running the revolution does not know anything about his enemy? And he says that Arisha, where they are, has a dormant ward stone, which is what powers the, which is what, which is what the wards are. They pop, but you need the out. Then what's a luminary? God damn it. He says, at least I think that's what it is. I was never let close enough to Basgiath to compare the two in any detail. A second ward stone? I thought only one was created during the unification. And he's like, yeah, well, the one that we have is useless. What we need is that God's damn luminary that intensifies dragon fire hot enough to smell alloy into the only weapons capable of defeating venom. That's our only shot. Okay, so you need a luminary that intensifies dragon fire. So we're gonna call it like a magnifying glass. So you shoot dragon fire through the magnifying glass and that's what smelts the alloy to create the weapons that then you give to the griffin riders to fight the venom. But then you also need those weapons to power the wardstone. Is that it? Did I finally get it? God, this is complicated. She's like, what if the wordstone isn't useless? This is the only person, this woman who just showed up to this revolution, is the only person who's thought, maybe the wordstone isn't useless. Make it make sense. Just because no one knows how to create new words today doesn't mean the knowledge can't exist somewhere like in the archives. He explains, we learned from Fen's mistakes. We're not attacking Navari like he did or declaring independence. We're fighting from right under their noses. We have a plan. Something killed off the Venon 600 years ago during the Great War. We're actively searching for that weapon. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me that they've been dealing with the Venon and now the venom exist and never stop to think, the, the revolution never stop to think, gee, maybe the wyvern also exist. No wonder this revolution has not succeeded. They are really fucking stupid. She asks about his life, still not asking how he faked his death, but asks about his life. Do you have kids? Do you have a partner? And he says no. But the way that this is worded where he says, I don't have a partner, I think it's hinting at Brennan being queer, which, all right, cool, more queer rep. You won't hear any complaints from me about having uh, more queer side characters in this series. I'm glad to see it. So he takes her to go see her dragons. Finally, she wants to leave. She wants to see her dragons. And she sees her dragon, Tiern, and also Andarna, who is, was her little baby dragon. Well, because of them using her feather tail power of the ability to stop time, Andarna aged up. And it says, what dot the dot fuck? That can't be. I've never seen such accelerated growth in a dragon before. And do you want to guess what color Andarna is now? She's no longer a little golden feather tail she is a black dragon because dragons are only gold feathered as hatchlings. Wait, she had feathers? Was her tail feathers or was she also, was she actually wholly covered in feathers? I'm, I'm confused. So from the energy usage, they forced her to grow. She stopped time for too long and she was forced into growing. And so she aged up and Tiern says, I should warn you that before she wakes up because she's sleeping, that this is a notoriously perilous age. And Violet's like, what do you mean for her? Is she in danger? And she said, and he says, no, she's like a teenager now. 
So she's gonna be moody. It says a teenager. Fabulous. Yes, fabulous. So the color of a dragon scales is hereditary, which begs the question, are General Melgren's dragon, Coda and Tyrn, are they like bros? Are they cousins? And, but because Indarna is black, she's like, wait, is she your baby? And, and she says, I swear to the gods, if she's another secret you kept from me, you'll what? <laughs> <laughs> like you'll what? I, I he's probably keeping tons of secrets from you. I don't I don't know why you think you're entitled to information about his kids. And he's like, no, I already told you she is not my child. And I'm like, wait, then what happened to her parents? Do dragons raise their own kids? What's going on here? She was gold when she was bonded to her. Nobody knew what color her scales would mature to. Only the eldest of our dens can sense a hatchling's pigment. In fact, two more black dragons have hatched in the last year, according to Coda. Does Coda share that with General Melgren, the bad guy? Is Coda bad or no? And he, she's like, well what kind of tail and he's like well tails are a matter of choice and need don't they teach you anything and at this point I laughed out loud you're not a notoriously open species you've got to be kidding me and oh my god this is ridiculous so they say they need to get back they probably have already been reported dead they're worried about being killed by the people who sent them to their death Violet says our mother won't let them kill me and Brennan's like say that again and pretend that you mean it this time the general's loyalties are so crystal fucking clear she might as well tattoo yes there are venom now go back Back to class on her forehead. This is great writing. I'm having the time of my life. You don't think she'd kill you, Violet? She threw you in the writer's quadrant. Listen, I think that Rebecca didn't know where we were going with the mom and did like a Violet mom evil. And then when she wrote this book, she was like, mm, Violet mom not evil. So anyway, she won't let Colonel Atos, Dane's dad, or General Markham kill me without evidence. You didn't see her when you didn't come home, Brennan. She was devastated. I know the atrocious things that she did in my name, he says. What atrocious things? And they're like, well, Dane's dad was in charge of war games, so Dane's dad must have set us up to die. They'll kill the others if we don't return. We can't cut off the flow of weapons that we are giving to the Griffin Riders. And they're like, but if Dane, Atos, puts his hands on her, he'll just rip the memories from her and then they'll know everything. So they agree that Zayden has to teach her to shield. Chapter three. There is no moment as rewarding, as stirring, as anticlimactic as the Riders' graduation. No shit. It's the only time I've ever envied the inter infantry quadrant. Major Afrenda's Guide to the Riders' Quadrant, unauthorized edition. They try to get Andarna to the veil where I guess the dragons are that that's where they stay and they I, and then they don't go to the college I don't really know I don't really understand so they need to get her to a safe place without being spotted because they don't want anybody to know that she aged up because then there would be questions on how she aged up and they don't want anybody to know that she's a black dragon they don't want to know anybody to know anything about her until she enters something called the dreamless sleep which is very important for adolescent dragons and if they don't do this they'll put every hatchling in danger and I'm like my question is how how would the dragons that are bonded to the humans who are in the Empire allow their own hatchlings to be put in danger by those humans? I'm very confused. Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. I still don't understand why the Imperium would even ever agree to let dragons bond human riders, knowing they'd have to guard their young not only against griffin flyers, but the humans they're supposed to trust. Good question. Let's see if we get a good answer. It's a delicate balance, Tarn replies. The first six riders were desperate to save their people when they approached the den 600 years ago. Those dragons formed the first Imperium and bonded humans only to protect their hatching grounds from venom, who were the bigger threat. We don't exactly have opposable thumbs for weaving wards or runes. If the Imperium knows this, why do they willingly work with the humans instead of just, I'm sorry, I have to ask again, enslaving them? I don't want that. I'm just saying that you're going to have to give me a reasonable answer for why that has not been done by the dragons. Neither species has been entirely truthful, but using the other for their own reasons and nothing more. That's a fucking cop out. There's no fucking way. They are d they are actively asking for information about baby dragons. I j I ah! And Violet's like, well, it never occurred to me to hide anything from you. And he says, there's I can do nothing to remedy the last nine months besides answer your worthwhile questions now. You could have told her the truth and told her, you have to do this stuff for me to keep dragons safe. I'll keep you safe in tandem, but my priority is other dragons. And some of your humans are doing some fuck shit that would keep my dragons not safe. I'm so confused about where loyalties lie. Tyrion was bound by his mating bond to Segeo, so at least he had a reason to keep everything he did for me, but it's not like I can blame Andarna for being a kid who followed his lead. And Zayden is 
is another matter matter entirely though. Okay. Um, no. See, the Taren keeping stuff from you makes some sort of sense, but not in regards to scale. It, it has, it, it makes sense because he's a dragon and he doesn't owe you shit. What doesn't make sense is you expecting Zayden to tell you anything when you did not do any work to prove that you were safe or Zayden to tell rebellion info to. What are you talking about? And then Andarna and Tyrion get into it and he tells her maybe you should work on your own landings before taking our bonded on a flight to meet Malak. I'm like, wait, you are now recognizing the puny gods of humans when in the previous video I remember saying that the dragons literally, this dragon literally said, we don't recognize your puny human god. What are you talking about? And they're going and they're like, are we going to be executed? Are they going to call us traitors? Are they going to, like, what's going on here? Because we like, we, we, we're showing up days after we're supposed to show up. We fought Venon. We can't tell anybody we fought Venon. So they're, they're not sure what's going to happen. Tyrion's like, call out if you expect it won't go your way. What do you mean? If you think that these people are bad, why don't you just roast them now? What's going on? I don't understand where the loyalty is. You would turn on the humans who disagree with your bonded? Is that it? So is your, is your loyalty to other dragons? Is it loyalty to the Imperium? Is it loyalty to the Empire? Is it loyalty to, I don't know. Violet asks Zayden, does the movement you're a part of wink wink have any scribes it can count as friends which the answer in a logical place would be yes they would have tried to conscript some scribes by now in the last six years of them running this rebellion you would think that they would have gotten to that already but it appears that they have not because this rebellion is a circus by all accounts it doesn't make sense since liam is dead and they know that they have to say that he's dead and that will mean that all of his stuff is going to be burned because part of the pantheon of gods is Malak the god of death and you have to burn all your stuff if somebody all their stuff if somebody dies but apparently uh who believes in that is just sort of comes with the tide because Violet and Zayden sneak into his room to steal a bunch of his letters so that they have Liam's letters and Violet's gonna hide them in her room she passes them off to her best friend Rhiannon and says hide them don't let anyone burn them then she goes off to the graduation ceremony but before her and Zayden argue again because we're gonna have the same argument over and over and over about how Zayden lies to her except no he didn't i sure as hell have never lied to you but the art of telling selective truth is something you're gonna have to master or we'll all be dead i know you trust rhiannon and riddick but you can't tell them the truth as much for their sakes as ours as ours i'm sorry knowing puts them in danger you have to be able to keep the truth compartmentalized if you can't lie to your friends then keep your distance and this is what he's telling her to do and what he did to her pissed her off and instead of just saying your advice is bad because it pissed me off she takes his advice and pisses off her friends for the entire first 35 40 percent of this book 640 page book and he's like I will ask I will answer any question you want to ask about me I want you to ask me questions about me I want to know that you trust me and that you want to know things about me I can't answer questions about the rebellion and she's like that's not good enough and this is when I really started to fucking hate Violet Sorengale he's like you didn't fall for an ordinary writer you fell for I'm sorry you fell for the leader of a revolution and he's like to some degree I'm always gonna have secrets which makes sense because that's about protecting the safety of other people people who did not consent to Violet knowing their information that could put them in danger. This makes sense to me. You know who it doesn't make sense to? Violet, who is super self-absorbed. And she's like, you have to be kidding me. Brennan's been lying to me for six years, letting me mourn his death when he's been well the fuck alive. It's like well the fuck aware from the last book, but in this book it's well the fuck alive. The whole time, my oldest friend stole my memories and possibly sent me to die. My mother built my entire life on a lie. I'm not even sure what parts of my education are real and which are fabricated. And he thinks I'm not going to demand total, complete honesty from him. He said, he he would tell you anything you wanted to know about him. Your brother didn't agree to that. Nobody else involved agreed to that. What's wrong with you? And she's like, am I really gonna have to issue an ultimatum to Zayden fucking Ryerson? Hyphenated. Kill me now. She's like, you have to be completely honest with me about everything. He's like, or what? She says, or I'll get busy unfalling for you. Chapter four. As dragons ferociously guard their both their young and any information regarding their development, only four facts are known about the dreamless sleep. First, it is a critical time of rapid growth and development. Second, the duration varies from breed to breed. Third, as the name suggests, it is dreamless. And fourth, they wake up hungry. I thought that we were gonna like fast track through Andarna doing the dreamless sleep and her wake up now and just start eating people. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. They go to graduation and Violet's mother sees her and she's like, thought you were dead. Her mouth tilting upward in, ex in an expression I'm almost scared to call pride before she quickly masks it. There's no anger in her eyes, nor fear, nor sh shock either, just relief. She wasn't in on Atos's plan. I know it with every fiber of my being. This is when I knew that we weren't gonna 
going to do mean mom Soren Gill in this book. We were going to do, well, sometimes I do imperialism, but I truly love my kids, General Soren Gill. So that's boring. We could have had mommy issues. We could have had it all. And instead we get so much, 640 pages of nothing. And her mom's like, why were they on the death roll? And Colonel Atos, Dane's dad, her mom's friend and partner in crimes against, I mean, certainly war crimes. Naturally we reported them dead, but obviously we should have reported them for desertion and dereliction of duty instead. And they're like, you sent us into combat and you're going to report us for desertion? General Sorengale's like, what the fuck is he talking about? And Zayden says, I was directed to take a squad beyond the wards to Athbeam and form the headquarters for Fourth Wing's war games. That's what happened at the end of the last book. We stopped to rest our riot at the nearest lake to pass the wards and we were attacked by griffins. That's not what happened. They were attacked by Venon, but they're too scared to tell the Empire that that's what happened. And we almost lost Sorengale, talking about Violet. So now they're pulling on the heartstrings of General Sorengale because those exist now, apparently. And Colonel Atos is like, he's lying. And I'm like, can't the dragons prove that he's not lying? Aren't they in support of this? I'm so confused. There's no way two dragons were brought down by a drift of griffins. Impossible. We should separate them, interrogate them individually. And I'm like, why don't you just ask the other dragons? Why don't you just ask your dragon to ask the other dragons? What are we doing here? And Zayden's like, here's the missive that I was given by Colonel Atos. Not sure what the destruction of a foreign village had to do with war games, but we didn't stick around to find out. Cadet Sorengale was was dying and I chose to preserve what remained of my squad. It took us days to find someone capable of healing me though, and I don't remember being healed, says Violet. I'm like, wait, aren't healers kind of a big deal? Wouldn't they be suspicious that a healer was randomly nearby this outpost? Healers get their own squadron, don't they? So wouldn't they keep track of who's where since those are also military members? I'm fucking confused. And they're like, well, where are the bodies of the dead cadets? And they're like, well, we burned them because that's what we do. General Sorengale's like, this is your handwriting, you fucker. You did this all for war games, you absolute fucking asshole. And he's like, but you told me that the games were at my discretion this year. So this means that he doesn't answer to her, which means he answers to who? General Melgren? So is she not in on it, but General Melgren is? Why? And if so, why didn't she team up with her husband against this empire? I'm fucking confused. And why would he know about the venom and the wyvern, but she doesn't? Does he know about the wyvern? How does this conspiracy just happen to not include Violet's mom? But anyway, Violet's mom is nice now, and she's like, maybe you're more like me than I give you credit for. And honestly, I don't hate this. We could have had mommy issues. It's just, we just didn't do anything with it. I kept hoping that she would like be evil and turn, but whatever. Colonel Atos comes up and he's like, we both know you were not taken off mission by Griffins. And Zayden's like, what else could it have been? Surely if you think there's another threat out there, then you would want to share that information with the rest of the quadrant so that we could adequately fight train to face it. And instead of, you know, dealing with that, he turns to Violet and says, you're such a disappointment, Violet. Okay, you are not her stepdad. Please back away. Personally, I think this is all easily solved by a missive to General Melgren. Surely he saw the outcome of our battle with the dr Griffins, Zayden says. Dane shows up and Violet's like, don't fucking touch me. Because the last time he touched her, he pulled a memory from her, told it to her, his dad, and that's what caused them to be in the situation where Liam died. And instead of just, you know, being normal, Zayden's like, yeah, don't touch her. She made her choice and it wasn't you. It will never be new. I know it. She knows it. The whole quadrant knows it. And this gets worse. Like we are doing the most cheesy love triangle shit possible here. What else? You gonna threaten to kill me, Ryerson? And Zayden says, no, why should I when Sorengale is perfectly capable of doing that herself? I'm so tired that we're pretending to give women agency by a man saying that he'll allow her to kill another man who pisses them off. It wasn't cute when Raysan did it and it's not cute here either. But wait, it gets worse because the bystanders are here. That was hot, Nadine comments. And Imogen says, love triangles can get so fucking awkward, don't you think? I do, Imogen. I do. I don't actually need it um, pointed out to me though. Please shut up. We get told that someone named Quinn, who I forget who they are in their rele relevance to this story, um, the blue streak in Quinn's short blonde hair curls bobs as she shoulder bumps in Imogen. Um, I think that they were dating. I don't know why I need to know so much about everybody's hair dye. I also find it interesting that the people who are queer are the ones with the hair dye. <laughs> Not the stereotype of us. I'll have you know that this is my natural color, including the grays. So the third years, including Zayden, graduate, and it says that they will receive their orders immediately for their new duty stations, and that they have until morning to depart on their dragons for their new duty stations. He'll be gone by morning, gone. Telling myself that I'll see him every few days because of Tyrion and Gale's mating bond doesn't quell the panic quickening my breaths. He won't be here, not on the mat, testing and pushing me to be better. Oh God, we're all so broken up about this, truly. So then immediately this graduation means that first years are now second years, second years are now third years, third years of graduation. 
graduated. The end. God, I wish. Out of the 11 who came through our squad during the year, both before and after threshing, the five of us are the only ones left standing for now. Dun dun dun. What? What? I feel like I said that wrong. I feel like that wasn't the right noise. Chapter 5. After three consecutive deaths of prisoners during his interrogations, it is this com command's opinion that Major Burton Varish should be reassigned from an active wing until further notice. First line of this chapter, riders party as hard as we fight, and we fight pretty damn hard. Amazing, riveting, truly next level literature right there. Thank you so much. They're getting drunk on lavender lemonade, which my god, does that sound delicious. And they bring up going to Shantara, which is basically this world's version of Hogsmeade, except it's this world's version of Hogsmeade meets the US military. Because if you don't know, the US military often has bases in other countries, and then US military members act fucking stupid, and then they get kicked out from being able to go places. The only time that the rider squadron in particular is allowed to go to Shantara are for worship only because apparently the temples are there and I'm confused. So the temples are in Shantara. Are all the temples in Shantara? Didn't Violet say something about needing to go to the temple at some point? But we didn't bring up Shantara in the last book. How would she have gotten there? Especially if the riders aren't allowed or are they allowed to go if they're going for temple? Are we just making this up as we go along? And she talks about how their squad is getting so much better because a couple of months ago Nadine was prejudiced against everybody with a Mark Rebellion relic. So their squad asks about, you know, the fact that some of them, including Violet and Imogen, went off with Zayden and company during war games, and two of them died and didn't come back. And they're not being honest about what really happened out there. And they're like, so how was it? And Imogen's like, to be honest, it fucking sucked. They all toast to Liam. Violet, drunk, goes off to talk to Zayden. She's like, you look good in officer flight leathers. Apparently, and this is confusing as fuck for me, if you graduate from the war college, you are a officer, an officer. If you have not graduated yet, you are a cadet. This is very confusing for me because this, the whole idea of an officer implies the existence of enlisted because in the military, you are either enlisted or you are an officer. And if you are an officer, it is because you have gone through training to become an officer. You can be a, you can be a commander and not be an officer. Okay. I think you are enlisted. If you want to go and be an officer, you have have to have like a college degree and I think go to officer training school but there's no it, like why are we using the term officer if there's no category of enlisted I was very confused by this because y'all know at one point Carlos had joined the military so I'm familiar with that shit and Rebecca's husband did like 20 years in it so I feel like she would know some of this especially because her husband got pretty high up in rank and like with that comes like you just learn more shit because you're around it so I'm like wait are you I what? so who's the enlisted people in this <laughs> I'm confused. I'm actually gonna have to have Carlos explain officer versus enlisted to me again as far as the ranks go. But in this world, there's no version of enlisted. So again, I'm very fucking confused. She's like, you look good in officer flight letters. He says, they're almost exactly like cadet ones. Thank you. I really needed to know that information. And he's like, how drunk are you? She says, I'm pleasantly fuddled, but not entirely sloshed. That makes exactly no sense. Actually, that does make sense. I've read a lot of sentences out of this book that don't make sense already. And we are only in chapter five, but that sentence right there makes sense to me. This is shocking. If you need an example of things that don't make sense, I have a list. And of course they're talking about their relationship again. She's like, I don't sleep with men I don't trust. And I'm like, wait, this, this implies that you've slept with men before. And if so, who are they? Because you have a friend in the scribe quadrant, but if you are at the war college where everybody goes, then who else were you sleeping with? And why haven't you run into them before? So like, do you have another friend? Are they in infantry? Have you slept with people in infantry? Like, I feel like this would have come up. I feel like it would have come up. Anyway, and he's like, I'll earn your trust as, long, as soon as you realize you don't need full disclosure. You only have to have the guts to start asking the question you actually want answers to. Don't worry about going back to bed together. We'll get back there. The anticipation is good for us. I actually now hate both of you even more than I previously did. I hate that. I hate everything about that. I think that that's gross. And if a man talked to me like that, I would knee him in the balls repeatedly. Please literally choke. Literally choke on your dragon scale. Dra I meant scales, not the scale the drag. Fuck. And who comes upon them but Colonel Atos, who is now being reassigned to a coastal outpost for fucking with the general's daughter. So just to be clear, if you fuck with the general's daughter and you're in the military, you get reassigned even if you are the general's best friend. If a random ass person comes into this military and kills the general's daughter, nothing happens to them. I don't get it. Uh, the major that's standing next to Colonel Atos slides his hand into the breast pocket of the, his perfectly pressed uni dress uniform and uh, pulls out two folded misses. 
lives. His black hair is perfectly combed, his boots perfectly shined, his smile perfectly cruel. Power rises within me responding to the threat. All the subtlety of a gun. This is a new major who has been assigned here and he's the bad guy of this book, Varish. And just like with introducing General Melgren, we just immediately introduce this guy and we do basically just describe him as he bad, okay? Make sure you know he bad. Violet, this is your new vice commandant, Major Varish. And he explains, well, you guys don't get to be together every few days. You're only allowed to fly to go have your dragons meet up because they can't be separated because of the mating bond every week. And they're like, what? Every week? They'll be in a near con constant state of pain. It's unfathomable. And Tiern roars at this. And I'm like, you could eat these people. What's stopping you, sir? Zayden says, dragons give their own orders. And Colonel Ato says, guess we'll see. What do you mean? He could eat you right now. What do you mean? How are you controlling what the dragons do? What do you mean? Are the humans in charge or are the dragons in charge? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. And he says, secrets make for poor leverage. They die with the people who keep them. So that's a threat. Chapter six. What no one openly says is that while all four quadrants obey the code of conduct, a writer's first responsibility is to the codex, which often overrules the regulations other quadrants live by. By definition, the writers make their own rules. Listen, nobody is more familiar with that than me, who pointed that out in excruciating detail, how the rules at this murder college are absolutely willy-nilly. You don't have to tell me. I know. I'm pretty sure Colonel Atos just insinuated he'd kill us. And if that wasn't clear enough, Colonel Atos then follows up with, do be careful of who you share your war stories, Violet. I'd hate to see your mother lose either of her daughters. So now he's insinuating he'll kill Mira too. Right. Zayden says, he just threatened your life. We know. We know. Stop. Stop. We the redundancy. And Mira's. And I just, again, how is this possible? Because Mira has a dragon. Violet has a dragon. Zayden has a dragon. All these dragons talk to each other. That guy has a dragon. Could their dragons not just talk to his dragon and be like, can you get your human to calm the fuck down? Isn't Mira's dragon going to have beef with that guy's dragon? Like if they all report that, uh, if all the dragons report this to the Imperium, won't the Imperium like that guy, that guy has to go or that guy has to at least shut the fuck up? Anyways, he leaves and Violet and Zayden and decide, actually, let's have the same fight we've been having. That's why this book is 640 pages. We aren't happening, remember? That's your choice. I have every right to walk back into the gathering hall and pick whoever I want to warm my bed. Someone a little more ordinary. You absolutely have every right, but you won't. Because you're impossible to replace. Because you still love me. I'm so glad I was here to witness this for the 15th time. How can I want someone who refuses to tell me his whole truth, who makes a game out of it, and his ridiculous ask me anything act? Like, I'd have the first clue what to ask. No, 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 Rebecca, you are not gonna lie to me because I read that other book. No, Girly Pop, this is the same Violet Sorengale who was literally asking him the most ridiculous questions like, what's your favorite food? And he was like, chocolate cake, why? Do not cite the deep magic to me, witch. I was there. I was there when it was written. Anyway, Zayden leaves. <laughs> Atos is the new wing leader and Rhiannon, her best friend, is the new squad leader. Yay! <laughs> Chapter 7. She's worried because Colonel Atos told her, don't tell anybody what happened or else I'll kill you and your sister. And she really wants to tell her friends what's going on. And she's going to ponder on this for at least the next 22 chapters. Isn't that great for me? Fewer dragons are bonding, I say to Tyr, knowing Andarna drifted into the, to the dreamless sleep a few days ago. Is that because the Empyrean knows about the Venon? He says, yes but we need more writers, not fewer. It doesn't make sense. You're right, it doesn't. You're right. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. The Empyrean main remains divided on whether or not we should get involved. Humans aren't the only species keeping secrets. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Goodbye. 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 Wait a fucking minute. Wait a fucking minute. You have got to be shitting me. Doesn't this mean that a bunch of fucking dragons are lying to their humans? and therefore are basically like faking this bond and relationship with them because these dragons are bonded with humans who are actively out to get information about baby dragons who the dragons are kind of worried about protecting. What do you mean? I'm gonna have to ask again if they care so little about the humans compared to dragon kind, if that's actually the case, then why don't they just enslave the humans? How is the Imperium divided? How does that make any sense? One group is saying a bunch of stuff like alluding to hurting, to testing 
on baby dragons? One group's not. How are you divided? I don't understand. Who's divided? Can I see these dragons? Can I hear their reasoning, please? Day one of being a second year. Welcome to Rider Survival Course, or RSC for short. Professor Grady says, do you know what it is? They don't know what it is. Good. Our tactics work. RSC is kept classified for a reason, so we get your genuine reactions to the situations at hand. So this is SEER training. SEER training stands for survival, evasion, reconnaissance, and escape. Escape. SEER training. You can look it up on YouTube. It's not a big secret anymore. It's something that the military does where they basically play act. Um, they like come into your classrooms and they like hold you. <laughs> they like do a hostage situation where they like pretend that these people come in and they're like bad guys. They come in, they take you, and you have been prepared previously for um, like how to deal with being interrogated. You also do stuff to like evade capture, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole thing. It's a whole several week training course. RSC will teach you how to survive if you become separated from your dragon behind enemy lines. My question is, how would you get separated from your dragon behind em enemy lines? Wouldn't your dragon just fuck shit up to come get you? Can you give an example of a time that this has happened? And this training culminates in two events that you have to pass in order to continue on at Basgia Bas on to year three. I will instruct you in instruct you in navigation, survival techniques, and how to withstand interrogation in case of capture. And as long as you don't break during the interrogation port portion, you will do just fine. And they're like, what if we break? And they're like, don't do that. I thought it was pretty obvious. They said, if you want to continue on at Basgia, you have to do this. You, you, you're just going to get recycled. Just like last, like what, what do you think? What do you think? Anyway, so Violet, hearing that Zayden doesn't want her to get involved in the revolution, decides, I actually want to get involved in the revolution, despite everybody telling me, hey, you have not learned to shield from Dane and he could just pluck anything from you at any time when he sneaks up and touches you that could put everybody else in danger, including your Herself, actually. She's like, no, fuck, fuck that. Fuck not getting involved. Time to get started, which is, you know, an objectively terrible idea, but whatever. It mentions how scribes are strongly discouraged from showing emotion. After all, their job isn't to interpret, but to record. And I'm like, damn, I wish that this had come up more in the last book to tell us more about like who Violet's dad was. She goes to see her friend, Jacinia, the scribe. And she says, I was wondering if you had any older books about the founding of Basgia. Oh, Artemis just made a little noise. My little baby dragon, my little feather tail. She, yeah, I don't know, maybe something about why they chose this location, Basgia, for the wards. And this is, you know, extremely specific information. And Jacinia's like, why? Violet's like, oh, I'm preparing a debate in history about why Basgiath is here instead of, um, you know, being built in Calder. And here's the thing is, this is already an idiot move on her behalf because she knows that typically Justinia would have to log her taking books out of the archives. Why not preemptively say, can we keep this between us? But instead, we just leave that plot hole right open for me to just sink into. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. She hands over two tomes written more than a hundred years ago, and I thank her again before leaving. The answer to protecting Arisha is in the archives. It has to be. I just have to find it before not even the wards can save us. Bitch, you're not even gonna make it there. You're gonna get told, hey, you're checking out books that you shouldn't be checking out. What are you doing? Zane's gonna pluck your memories out, and then you're done, because you're stupid. Chapter 8. They bring up the thing about her mom not holding off the storm last year while she was crossing parapet, and I had heard somebody say that her mom made that storm to make her fall off parapet and like honestly at this point that's the better option even though her mom could have just had her killed if she really hated her either way this is stupid this is a stupid way to write mommy issues clearly you don't know my mother she wouldn't call the storm to kill me like a coward I Okay, so they are at parapet again, except they are there, you know, working as they get the first years to cross parapet. They're taking down names and stuff. And so she's writing down names and one guy walks up to her and she recognizes him and she's like, um, Cam? And he says, Auric, Grey Castle. And she's like, did you just make that up? Because it's awful. And he says, Auric, Grey Castle, write it. And Dane also recognizes this guy and says, does your father know? It's none of his business, says Auric. I'm 20. And Dane's like, well, he's gonna kill us all. Violet tells Rhiannon that is King Tori's third son. Do you remember that this nation has a king? Me neither. He rarely comes up. And I can guarantee that his father doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm like, yeah, you just said that. He just said it. You did. You, I, okay. And apparently Arik's brother died during threshing three years ago. The next person to walk up, her name is Sloane Myrie with a rebellic, rebellion relic winding around her arm. This is Liam's sister. And she's like, you are Violet Sorengale. Go straight to hell. I really mean 
saying that you got my brother killed. He died for you. I hope no one commends your soul to Malik. I hope he rejects it. And Tiern, mine speaks to her and says, it wasn't your fault Liam died. And she says, it was. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. It was literally Colonel Atos's fault. And then the wyvern that killed his dragon. I don't understand how that's Vila's fault. It's sort of kind of almost my fault because things that were completely out of my control happened. No. Major Varish, the bad guy, is there and his one-eyed orange dragon is there. Tiern sort of hints that he's the reason why this dragon only has one eye. This dragon's name is Solus. One of the new first years runs and Solus shoots fire at, uh, you know, breathes fire at a bunch of people. Violet tackles Sloane Mari, the uh, Liam's sister, in order to protect her. Violet gets a little bit burnt by Solus the dragon. And one of the marked people, Kiaren, gets burnt. And they're like, there's no way that was intentional, right? Another girl runs away. Solus is about to breathe fire again. And Tyrion's like, you do not have the right to burn what is mine. And he roars at Solus and Solus backs off. And I'm like, wouldn't the other dragons feel exactly the same way though? Where are they? Why isn't the Empyrean called about this? But they were called about Violet having two dragons? Why don't they get called in for stuff like this? This has never happened before. Tyrion says, if Solus comes near you again, he knows I will devour him his human hole and let him rot within me while his heart still beats and then I'll take the eye I so graciously left him and she's like all right well now I feel like me and Solus are you know gonna be at odds. Chapter 9 and in the mountains of the Steel Ridge Range the green dragons known for their keen intellect and rational countenance offered their ancestral hatching grounds for the good of dragon kind and the wards of Navarre were woven by the first six at what is now Basgiath War College. She thinks about the venom and how one of them got away. She says red veins spidering away from his malevolent eye. I felt like that probably meant spider webbing away and she does use spider webbing later to talk about this and I'm like what is spidering away? Like <laughs> spidering away. <laughs> But I did ask and apparently this is a normal way to use it. It's just in my mind, I was picturing something else. And she feels like it's her fault that Liam's dead. So she's, and she's also like, I watched the venom suck the life from the ground and anybody who was standing on the ground had the life sucked out of them. And I feel like I'm not fast enough. And she feels like it's because of her disability. So she starts um, training in running so she can run away from the venom faster. And Imogen starts training with her. And Rhiannon can tell something's wrong. And she's like, what's going on? She's like, nothing's wrong. I'm just running, I'm just running. From nothing. It's fine. And this starts the beginning of Rhiannon constantly asking, what are you hiding from me? And Violet being like, nothing. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. In a very obvious way. So not great. So they are in their first battle, battle brief class as second years. And Riddick looks around at all the first years and like, look at all those first years with their quills and ink. And Nadine says, there once was a time when we didn't have lesser magic to power ink pens. Stop acting superior. And I'm like, I still don't fucking understand the pens. So battle brief class is run by two professors, a writer and a scribe, and the professor who is the scribe quadrant professor is Colonel Markham. Now why they don't have regular classes where they're being taught by like a variety of different kinds of professors from all different squadrons, and in fact why they don't just mesh all of the different squadrons together to learn with each other, because infantry could get just as much out of battle brief as the rider squadron? I don't know. But then how would we have time for Violet to have the same thought over and over about how she can't trust Zayden and she also can't tell Rihanna and what's going on. And she's like, I think Colonel Markham is a liar. He's been keeping information. He knows everything he has to. He wrote the fucking textbook on Navarian history that all writers are taught from. And until last year, I was his star pupil, the one he handpicked to succeed in this quadra the scribe quadrant. He's the foremost authority at Basgaith when it comes to all matters of not only our history, but current events as well. Some of you may not know this, but information on the front is actually received at Basgaith before it's sent to the king in Chaldeer. And I'm like, yeah, no shit, that's, that's pretty normal. I mean, of course the military is going to report it to the military who could then form a formal report to give it to the king who is not at the military. Okay. <laughs> and you know whose son should be in this class, but you know, the king, the king's son, uh, Cam, who's going by Arik, and and she's like, one good look and Markham will know he, who he is, but with that haircut, if he keeps his head down, he's got a good shot at blending in. Terrible plan. Terrible plan. It works, but it's a terrible plan. Feels like a little bit like a plot hole. It's quite convenient. They talk about how an outpost was raided by Griffins, and she's like, this is bullshit. I know everything he's telling us is bullshit. So after class, she goes to Bodhi and she's like, I want in. I want to help. And Bodhi's like, for fuck's sake, no, you aren't doing your training to keep your shields up 
to keep Dane out of your head, to keep you from spilling secrets. No, she asks Imogen, how am I supposed to go back to class like nothing happened? And Imogen's like, you're supposed to act like nothing happened. Because if you don't, you're putting yourself and a bunch of others at risk. Why are you so selfish? The arrogance from Violet is really starting to piss me off at this point, and we're only in chapter nine. The fact that she could have made a plan with Brennan before she left, and then she didn't, is really, I mean, just fucking stupid. She said that she was willing to help. They gave her a job. She said, I agree with the rebellion. They gave her a job, keep your shields up. And then after that, she could have made a further job up. Let me get some information, but I have my shields up. So now I can keep that information from Dane. You also know that she grew up poised to be a scribe and she also has her dad's book. So why don't you give her the job of looking through her dad's belongings to see if her dad knew anything, to see if he had any further information like we've been hitting at, hinting at for the last one and a quarter books. Instead, she completely forgets about her dad the majority of the time. She also forgets about Brennan the majority of the time. And then of course Rhiannon comes up to her and she's like, I think the school's hiding something from us. There's something going on in the he healer quadrant. I tried to take a first year to go see Nolan, who is a mender, which means he's bonded to a dragon and his power is not just healing, it's mending, which is special magic healing like Brennan has. And Varish, the new bad guy, said that he had more important things to do than talk to cadets and escorted Nolan to the back of the infirmary, which is now guarded. I think they're hiding something back there. So now the question where asking is what's going on with Nolan the Mender? What are they hiding in the healer's quadrant? Violet blows Rhiannon off despite this being you know the first hint that Rhiannon doesn't trust the school. Instead she goes back to her books. Naturally the secrets of ward building weren't going to be in the first book of research but it would have been a pleasant surprise for something to be easy. See I'm having the exact opposite experience reading this. I feel like everything in this book is just easy and convenience. Rhiannon comes back again asks her are you mad at me? And see this is the problem with not preparing Violet to be a double agent is that she was not prepared. She's really bad at it, which makes it really obvious when the point is trying to keep Rhiannon safe by not telling her stuff, but the obviousness is making it clear to Rhiannon that something is wrong. So she's going to try to figure out what it is. It feels like you're avoiding me and it's ridiculous, but all I can think is that maybe you're pissed that I chose Sawyer as executive officer in yesterday instead of you. And if that's the case, then let's talk about it. See, this is the part where Violet should have been like, yes, that is the thing I'm mad about to throw Rhiannon off of her scent. But Violet isn't smart. Despite us being told she's clever, she's actually not. They're back in fighting class and Sloane Myrie wants to fight Violet. And Violet's like, pass pass on that. Thank you. And Sloane's like, well, from Imogen's letter, I know that her joints pop out. I could take her. And Violet's like, no, you can't. And also, ew, that's really gross of you to say that. And she's also like, Imogen, what the fuck? Why did you tell her that? And Imogen says, you see, I didn't really like you last year. Remember, you're kind of an acquired taste. Violet says, great. I appreciate that. I quit back sarcastically. I quit back sarcastically. Not only did the sentence imply that she was being sarcastic, you already used the word quit. You actually don't need to tell me I quit back sarcastically. It's implied. What's with the redundancy? Somebody with a deep voice said, did somebody say Sorengale? And Nadine says, oh yeah, hi, I'm Violet Sorengale to this random person who walks in the room. And the man walks up to her and snaps her neck. Now, I don't really know Nadine, so if this was supposed to make an impact, it doesn't. To me, this is just another red shirt. Chapter 10. It's not unheard of that a candidate enters the writer's quadrant having been paid to assassinate a cadet. I'm sorry Mira was targeted, but proud to say she dispatched the threat quickly. You have enemies, General. Official notice from Commandant Pancha to General Sorengale. Who would be the enemy of General Sorengale? Who would be, if it's the rebellion kids, then why do they let them in the writer's quadrant? What do you mean? So she gets into a fight with this guy and before, like while they're fighting, he whispers to her, secrets die with the people who keep them. His eyes are light brown, but rimmed in red as if he's on some kind of drug. And she knows that he was sent by Colonel Atos to kill her because you know, the whole secret, secret are no fun thing. And I just feel like there's a bunch of ways to prove that this guy was sent by Colonel Atos and that she can tell her mom and her mom will be like, oh, it wasn't enough to send this man away. I actually have to um, fucking kill him. But no, we're not going to do that. So she kills this guy who was sent to kill her and Dane shows up and he tries to reach for her and she's like, don't dot touch dot me. And Dane's like really confused by this. He was probably sent as a message to your mother, the professor says. Same thing happened to your older sister during her years. A message from whom? From a rebellion person? Don't they think they've squashed the rebellion? 
rebellion? And if they haven't, then why would they let rebellion kids join the best part of the military? Who else would be sending a message to General Sorengale by killing her children? What are we saying? Zayden's back. It's been a week, so we are having their dragons hook up to smash, and Zayden's back, and it says that she senses him. A heartbeat before I reach for my door handle, I feel it. The familiar midnight tinted shadow wrapping around my mind. Ah yes, the midnight tinted shadow, as opposed to the 11 p.m. tinted shadow. He talks about how, oh, I warded your door so only I can get in, you can get in, and then whoever you hold the hand of can get in. They make sexual comments towards each other, and he's like, we could smash, but in order to smash, you have to tell me you love me. Actually, he says it only takes three words, and she thinks that he means I want you, but what he means is I love you. And they mention how um, Sloane hates her, Liam's sister hates her, and he's like, she doesn't hate you. I tried to hate you, and it's impossible to hate you. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You never hated her, and why would you? Why would you have tried to hate her? You're friends. You're planning a rebellion with her brother. She is much of a chance as turning as Brennan did, so why wouldn't he see an opportunity in her from the jump rather than a person he should maybe try to hate? I don't get it. This was never enemies to lovers. She says that them walking across parapet the first years, it was really sad. A lot of, a lot of people lost their lives. He says it's always too many people losing their lives. The first year is when some of us lose our lives. The second year is when the rest of us lose our humanity. It's all part of the process of turning us into effective weapons. Desensitizing us to death? Yes. And I think that that would be a good thing to ponder on. Unfortunately, we're not really doing anything thematically here with that. He has to leave almost as soon as he appears, which, oh, what a bummer. And he doesn't have time to spend time with her. So he actually had written her a letter and left it uh, for her, which actually I don't hate because one of my favorite things is when a romance is cultivated more by the people uh, writing letters to each other. Check out The Perfect Crimes of Marion Hayes for more. <laughs> Chapter 11. Garrick has always been my best friend. His father was at, was my father's aide, which in a way makes him my Dane, except trustworthy. After Liam, Bodhi was and still is the closest thing I have to a brother, perpetually tagging along a step behind. Recovered correspondence of Lieutenant Zayden Ryerson to Cadet Violet Sorengale. He wrote me a letter and I've read it so many times I already have it memorized. This is honestly very true of whenever you are a male girlfriend or fiance or whatever the fuck, or you know, significant other and your uh, significant other goes off to basic training. It's like, you know, you get the letters in the mail, you reread them like a million fucking times because it's the only way you can communicate. So I can like feel the mill spouse coming through the page here. <laughs> and her friends are like, why don't you just take Zayden back already? You're so obsessed with his letters. Why don't you just take him back already? And she says, he doesn't trust me. And I'm like, bitch, what are you talking about? That's not even true. Why are we wasting time saying things that, saying things that are not true? It's not that you're not trustworthy. No one ever said that. It's that you need knowing information is a liability. So, and not that he doesn't trust you to keep that information, but that it could be taken out of you by Dane, tortured out of you by Varish. You've never been tortured before. You've not been through the seer training. You don't know if you'll break or not. So it's better for you not to know things about the rebellion that you just found out about that exists five fucking seconds ago. But Zayden does trust you with information about himself. And instead of you asking questions about him, which you were so keen on doing in the last book, you're like, no, I don't want to ask him questions about him. I couldn't even think of one if I tried. I only want to know about the rebellion. Oh my god, I don't think I've been this annoyed with a character in a long time. It's also really arrogant to think that you're entitled to information that could put other people's lives at risk who did not agree to you having their information. I wish that somebody would call her out on this in text like Bodhi, he's right there and he could tell her, hey, you just got here. You're not entitled to know everything and Zayden is offering to give you information about himself and that's not good enough because you are so self-absorbed you think you're supposed to know everything. She goes and sees her friend Jacinia again, which again, who is translating this apparently. She's like, I actually need help as well. So if we could like, you know, mutual help each other and then somebody gets dragged away in front of them and Jacinia is like I think that that was my fault I recorded that guy asking for a book and now he's being dragged away okay I'm back different day I have kids we're on spring break everything's on fire but I have childcare for the day so I'm going to finally get some work done so let's get back to it so Jacinia was asking Violet for assistance and Violet was asking Jacinia for assistance uh, Violet wants Jacinia to help her locate books Jacinia 
sees a guy being dragged away that had asked her for a book. She did log that book that he had requested and apparently this was a red flag, a glaringly obvious red flag that Empire Evil! I don't know how it's possibly possible that Justinia just happened to not log the books that Violet was looking for but logged the books that the other guy was looking for but okay that's convenient but you know what isn't convenient in this book. Violet asks what book did he ask for and Justinia says I have to go. <laughs> there was this weird line where Violet's walking out and sees like all the dragons and we've had this issue in a different book before that I will not name. <laughs> like I talk about that series enough where kaleidoscope is used where I don't think it belongs and also like kaleidoscope was also made in the 1800s and I just feel like it's a little bit anachronistic. Although I don't know what fucking time period this is. I mean it's just convenience basically. Whatever time period of whatever shit needs to be invented. I'm getting off topic. The point is there's a point after this where it says we reach the top walking into the box canyon of the flight field and my heart swells at the sight of the dragons organized in the same formation we stand in at in the courtyard. It's a beautiful terrifying humbling kaleidoscope of power that steals the breath from my lungs. I don't understand. Is this a trend that I'm just not aware of where people use kaleidoscope in that way? Because I feel like I, it doesn't work for me and it it's breaking immersion is, is what I'm getting at. There was definitely a better way to have written that sentence is all I'm saying. Violet receives a letter and realizes that parts of it have been redacted. It's from her sister and her friend Rhiannon asks who would have redacted your letter and Violet says I'm not sure but in her head she thinks Melgren, Varish, Markham, anyone on Colonel Atos's orders, her own mother, the options are endless and I'm like wait see so you're back to thinking your mom's bad again? She hears Professor Kaori who is the guy who's like obsessed with learning about dragon kind but in I think an okay way like he doesn't seem to be glaringly obviously written as evil so you know if it's not lacking in subtlety then I think we can venture a, a, a sure enough guess. Professor Kaori says that he um, heard about another black dragon being spotted. Violet reaches out to Tiern and is like what the hell did people see in Darna? He says that only a few dragons saw her before she entered caves for the dreamless sleep and again I'm just having to ask if they are so worried about the humans hurting their dragons, why do they align themselves with the humans? Major Varys shows up and says that since they are at flight practice and Andarna is not there, he's disappointed. He wants Andarna to be there to practice flight maneuvers at least next week and Tiern, her dragon, her black dragon, growls at this, her bigger black dragon, growls at this and she says dragons don't take orders from humans and he says of course not but you do, don't you? Yeah, but you're asking her to do something that we just established is impossible. You're not ordering her, you're ordering her to order a dragon, which is impossible. Shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't the Imperium have an issue with this? The Imperium of dragons? Shouldn't other dragons have issues with this, including his own? Like, are, is, does his own dragon not care about baby dragons? Do all the other dragons not care about her being forced into a position where a baby dragon is being ordered around, despite the fact that all the dragons know that baby dragons have to go into the dreamless sleep? Like, what, what are we doing here? Who is in charge, ultimately? And we bring up again that Violet's father was doing research on feather tails, baby dragons. From what Colonel Atos told me, this is Major Varish talking, your father was writing a book on feather tails, dragons which hadn't been seen in hundreds of years, and then you ended up bonded to one. Oh, that's right, because the humans don't know that the feather tails are baby dragons. Right, but the dragons know, right? So why would they let the humans get away with fucking with their baby dragons? What? Why would a why would a dragon bonded to a human allow for that? What? She says it's a coincidence that her dad was looking into feather tails and then she ended up bonded to one and she's like to Tiern, wait is that a coincidence and Tiern says I know nothing of your father's research who does know about the father's research other than Violet and why doesn't she think to look into this more it seems pretty pertinent don't you think but no anytime that somebody else isn't bringing it up Violet's never thinking about it so clever our Violet so glad that we're told explicitly and repeatedly that Violet is so clever they are practicing a move where they have to move from the seat to the shoulder of of their dragons and Tiern's like we're not ad adapting to that. They'll either adapt their request or I'll eat him, the dragon watcher. And I'm like, so you'll eat the guy who says that you have to adapt to a flight maneuver, but you won't eat the guy who is insinuating that Violet has to boss around a baby dragon. I'm confused. Bodhi comes up to Violet and says, hey, can you mind speak your way over to Zayden 
and let him know that we are working on the next shipment, which is shipment of weapons that they are supplying to the Griffin Riders to fight the Venom. And she's like, I'm starting to feel like a letter. He says, well, you're the easiest way and the fastest way to get information to Zayden. Duh. I'm like, didn't you want to be involved? Shouldn't this make you happy? You've been complaining about not having information. Here's some information. Congratulations, bitch. You got what you want. But no. Bodhi says to her, I've never seen him care like this. And that includes with Catriona. And it says, my gaze whips towards him. Who the hell is Catriona? He winces and presses his lips in a thin line. What are the chances you'll forget I said that between here and Samara? Who, th what do you mean who the hell is Catriona? Like use basic like contextual clues here. Probably Zayden's ex. You never asked Zayden, do you have an ex-girlfriend? You had the opportunity to ask Zayden anything. He said you could and you didn't take it. So I don't think you're in a position to be mad that Zayden has an ex-girlfriend when you never asked. What are we doing here? Are you 12? It's time for her to go over to where Zayden is stationed. It's been a week and Tiern and his mate Scale, Zayden's dragon, need to be together, probably in a sexual way, which I don't want to know about. God, I hope we don't have to know about that. Aren't the sex scenes between Zayden and <laughs> Violet enough? So they're gonna fly off and before she leaves, Major Varish shows up in a set and says, you have to delay your launch. You need to dump out your bag. And Taryn says, if they try to stop us, that he'll eat them. And I'm like, you'll eat them over trying to stop you from going somewhere, but you won't eat them over basically implying they'll threaten your rider, your baby dragon, and also the fact that they are engaging in an entire conspiracy to not let everybody know about the venom. Okay, sure. She dumps out her bag, but she doesn't have the books that she's been having Justinia get for her out of the library. They're in her room and nobody can get in her room because Zayden warded it. How that's allowed is beyond me. And before she leaves, he says, see you in 48 hours, Cadet Sorengale. And don't forget, since your feather tail decided not to join you in for formation again, I will be pondering your punishment for dereliction of duty while you are gone. And I'm like, how is that dereliction of her duty? Again, we've established that she can't command the dragons. Why are we even entertaining this? Chapter 12. Sigail watched me kill another cadet for bullying Garrick during threshing. She says she chose me for my ruthlessness, but I think I just reminded her of my grandfather. Recovered correspondence from Zayden Ryerson. Hold on. Hold the fucking phone. Is this what we're talking about when... No, it can't be. That that can't be the murder that Zayden did because that would mean that Dane wasn't there or is this the one that Dane's talking about? Is this a rumor that Zayden killed people in cold blood when in reality he just killed people for bullying his friend Garrick? That's what we're doing here? We're making Zayden out just to be a bad guy because he is actually really nice and, and sticks up for his friends? I Okay, fine, whatever. I still don't understand why we call Zayden a cold-blooded killer, but sure, fine, whatever. She gets to the place where Zayden is stationed and he is, uh, uh, in a ring fist fighting somebody. So of course he is. And apparently they are fist fighting uh, in order to determine who gets the pass for the lieutenants this weekend. And her watching Zayden fight somebody is of course, what else would it be? It's a turn on. Of course it is. Turned on. Maybe it's toxic as hell. Yes. Maybe it's pointless to deny that every single part of me is attracted to every facet of Zayden. And it's not just his body. It's dot, 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 everything. Stop. <laughs> Even the darkest parts of him, the parts I know are merciless, willing to annihilate anyone and everyone who stands between him and a goal, pull me in like a moth to a fucking flame. I did not need to be here for that. Didn't need to. It was implied. I'm good. And of course, um, she can't handle not touching him, so they make out. He cradles the back of my head, protecting me from the core stone, and angles for a deeper kiss. Gods, yes, deeper, more. I can't get enough. I'll never get enough. Oh my god, I'm so glad my kids aren't home. I can't get enough. I'll never get enough. What about me? What if I have had enough? What of that? What about my feelings? Okay, Violet. He's like, we should stop. She says, what if I don't want to? I'm not ready for this to end. Not ready to return to a reality where we're not together, even if I'm the one standing in our way. Yes. Please remind me for the umpteenth time why you feel like you can't trust this rebellion leader because you feel entitled to information. Let's do it all over again. Please, I am thirsty for it. Oh God, we have to stop or I won't be able to keep, we have to stop or I won't be able to keep the ki the, the keep to the kiss only limitation. Why is it that every time people are writing fantasy romance and they want the guy to sound sexy, he just comes off as rapey? Why are we doing that so often? Could we reflect and maybe try a new thing? We're writers, right? We can try new things. Fuck, I want you. Then don't stop. Oh my God, this is embarrassing. I hope my neighbors can't hear me. I look him in the eyes so he knows I mean it. We can keep it to nothing but sex. We did last year. Not that it worked well. And he's like, if you want me, there's nothing I want more 
more than to peel these pants off your amazing ass and fuck you until you're hoarse from screaming my name so limp from orgasms that you can't fathom leaving my bed every again and every tree goes up and around here goes up in flames from the lightning strikes but not until you remember how good we are together so basically I don't want to have sex until you tell me that you love great these people are wonderful to hang out with I'll kiss you whenever you want because my self-control is shit whenever you're involved whenever I want yes whenever you want because I'll live with my mouth attached to yours if I do it whenever I want isn't that really just what this book is isn't that really it I'm dying inside I'm begging you Violet don't offer me your body unless you're offering me everything I want more than I want you more than I want to fuck you I want those three little words back and he she says you need to trust me even with secrets for this to work ah not your secrets not his secrets there are other people's secrets who did not agree to this why are you so selfish so he agrees to tell her some stuff but like not stuff that involves other people stuff that she already knows about answering basic questions about stuff she already knows about which makes sense why they didn't do this earlier and had the same fight over and over is beyond me when we were at the lake before resin you said the only thing that can kill a venom is what powers the wards yes he says the daggers are made out of the material that powers the wards the alloy Brennan mentioned so he shows her his daggers that piece is the alloy the metal in the hill it's a specific blend of materials smelted into what you see there it's not power in itself but it's capable of holding power the wards themselves originate from the veil near Basgia, but they only reach so far these daggers help to hold extra power to boost the wards and extend them the more material the stronger the wards there's an entire armory of them downstairs at the place where they're at boosting the wards the details are classified but that's why outposts are placed strategically to keep our borders from developing weak points okay so because I have created a literal <laughs> diagram of how this works I'm starting to understand I still feel like it's a little bit convoluted and I did decide to look up on TikTok whether or not the actual fans of this series seem to understand this stuff and the general consensus is a lot of people are a little bit confused so I think that this could have been a uh, streamline to <laughs> make it a little bit easier for people to understand without literally having to draw it out. Maybe I'm just stupid though. I'm a little confused about what kind of power the alloy holds that allows them to create wards, but I don't know, maybe I'm asking too many questions. And apparently they only hold so much power and once it's been imbued, it has, to, once the power is used up, it has to be imbued again. Imbuing is a process of leaving power in stasis in an object. A writer has to pour their own power into it, which is a, a skill not a a lot of us have. At this point I'm getting a little confused. This magic, it, we're we're dabbling into hard magic but we're not doing it well. At least in my opinion. Maybe y'all are understanding this in a way that I'm not. She asks, have we always been placing the alloy in daggers? He says, no, that started right before the rebellion. My guess is Melgren had a vision of how an upcoming battle was going to go and these were central to his vig victory. Once Gale chose me at threshing, we started to work to smuggle out a few daggers at a time to supply what drifts we could to make friendly contact with. When wouldn't it make more sense if these dragons were doing what Scale sort of just did and bonding to people and then manipulating them? That again begs the question, the Imperium of Dragons, do they all, do they, do they all not care about the baby dragons possibly being harmed by the Empire? I'm so confused! It would make way more sense again if the dragons just enslaved the humans but uh, and again I have to ask why we're not doing that like what reasonable explanation is there but it would make a lot more sense if there were was like a faction of dragons that also rebelled and there wasn't an imperium and that therefore the rebellion dragons have decided to bond with these kids and be like hey here's what's actually happening and here's what I need you to do for me you owe me because I'm your bonded and I gave you power like that makes more sense to me he says Arisha needs a forge to smelt the alloy to make Make more weapon and the forge is the luminary I guess or is the forge is the luminary part of the forge I don't know it takes dragon to fire a crucible which we have and a luminary to intensify dragon fire hot enough to smell wait so now there's a crucible Jesus Christ there's more parts to this chapter 13 she is being forced to use her power over and over and over and over again her lightning power by major Varish the bad guy along with the other guy who teaches you how to wield your dragon superpower whose name I don't remember. She asks Tyrion while this is going on, you wouldn't happen to know how to raise wards would you? Tyrion says, I'm old, always holding back dr secret dragon knowledge but wards are not among it. Great. Varish says you can either use your power as many times as I tell you to or you can go into the brig and I'm like okay I choose brig. <laughs> Put me in jail. <laughs> Lock me up chief. Like I'm not gonna burn myself
himself out. And we tried to explain away why this is even allowed to happen when technically what he's doing is trying to command a dragon or at least command another person to command a dragon. Despite her being at risk of burning out because she's producing more than 26 strikes in an hour and he keeps telling her to do it, she thinks, well, there's only so much that Tyrion can do. He's bound by the Imperium. I have to risk the rules of the Quadrant or risk the Brig and I'd rather bring down a thousand lightning strikes than spend one night locked in a cage at Varish's mercy. Wait, I, hmm, hold on. But again, this implies that he can even ask you to command a dragon. He can't. Why are we here? This is her punishment for not commanding her dragon, for not doing something that nobody's allowed to do. What? This doesn't make sense. You have to make a reasonable ex explanation for why this makes sense. And Tyrion's like, Varish tells her to keep going, make lightning strikes. She's starting to literally burn from the inside out. He's like, well, keep going unless your golden one would like to fly up and say hello. Since she failed to appear as ordered, if she joins us, we'll only task you with three more. I just, this, I, you, you can't command a dragon. I'm so confused. Tyrion says this is what happens when dragons choose poorly. Solus should never have given this barbarian more power. And I'm like, wait, why is Solus bad? So is there a faction of the Imperium that is literally just evil dragons? How's that allowed? Varish is like, I don't want to submit your baby dra your feather tail for any, for tests or anything barbaric. I just want her to understand that she's not above the structure of the command. What do you mean? And Darna literally is above the structure of the command. She's a dragon. Dragons aren't commanded by humans. We've said this a million times. How is this even allowed right now? How is the other major, major car even entertaining this? Why is Taryn even entertaining this? Literally just for drama. Like there's not a good explanation. It's literally just for drama because instead of writing a good explanation, we were just like, eh, it's just happening. Why? Just cause, just cause he bad. And she's worried. She, she's worried. And Taryn's worried that Varish might, if he finds out that Andarna is a baby dragon, might bond a hatchling. And I'm like, hold on. How would he force a bond on a hatchling? What the fuck? What are you talking about? How would the dragons even let it get that far? Again, I'm not even sure why the dragons allowed Andarna to show up at threshing last year. Why was that allowed? Where was the Imperium then? Like dragons don't command humans, certainly, but don't dragons command dragons? Wait, no, humans don't, con humans don't command dragons, but don't dragons command dragons? I mean, you say that there's elders who have all these special powers and they're in charge. Tyrion is technically one of them. You're not in charge? I, 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 mm. And she says, again, humans don't command dragons and that includes you. And I'm like, okay, then this is an empty threat and she's being punished for something that has nothing to do with her. So therefore, again, I'm just gonna keep saying it. This makes absolutely no fucking sense. She um, loses control of her power, starts to burn from the inside out. Tyrion finally snaps, finally, and is like, silver one is done. Major Carr finally decides to step in and says, if she dies, you will summon the wrath of not only General Sorengale, but General Melgren. Her signet is the weapon generals dream of in this war. And if that's not enough to encourage a degree of caution, Vice Commandant, then remember that her death will cost you two of the most dragons on the continent and Lieutenant Ryerson's irreplaceable ability to wield shadows. I am so confused. I am so confused about all of this. I, I don't even know where to begin. In that case, why... <laughs> Why, why don't they see them as a threat? What, why don't, why don't, I, why don't, why don't Violet and, and Zayden, if they're so powerful, so much more powerful, and their dragons are so much more powerful than everybody else, why don't they just say, actually, we're done. We're done doing this empire shit. We're gonna tell everybody about the venom. Uh, I'm actually gonna bring you a venom's head back, prove that they're real, and we're taking over. Like, what's stopping them since they are more powerful than everybody else? Literally, what's stopping them? This is stupid. And Varys tells her, "That's the, this is the only warning you'll get, Soren Gale. Warning to what? Somehow fix the rules so that the Imperium makes it so that she does command her baby dragon? What are you talking about? And while I agree that we do not command dragons, perhaps you could talk Andarna into making an appearance. No, <laughs> she can't. <laughs> They don't command dragons. Uh, uh, and, Darna could, and Darna could literally fly off for weeks and do whatever the fuck she wants. And humans aren't allowed to be mad about it. That's the setup that we've been given. So she's burnt to a crisp. Uh, she's super red. She gets dunked in a river. Her friends come and get her. Imogen's like, he used your signet as a punishment for Andarna not showing for flight maneuvers. What? Are you kidding me? And I'm like, won't the other dragons be mad about this considering that this is a person who they don't value trying to manipulate one of their infant dragons.
dragons, now teenager, and harming another dragon's rider in the process to the point where he's now pissed off that dragon who's an elder? Who the fuck is in charge here? She doesn't tell her actual friends like Rhiannon, she only tells Zayden's friends like Imogen what really happened to her because she's worried that her friends will have harm come to them. And then she finds out that the guy who was dragged away after requesting a book that Jacinia logged was murdered. He was found dead in his room. There's no explanation for him being found dead in his room, beaten to death. This chapter ends by her being on her way to class and then having a bag being thrown over her head. Chapter 14. There is a natural distrust that must be overcome between infantry cadets and riders. This exists mainly because riders will never trust that infantry has the courage to hold the line when dragons arrive, and infantry will never trust that dragons won't eat them. You know what would be a really simple fix to that is mingling, having them be in classes together, working in tandem with dragons together, even though they're not bonded, they could still work around the dragons you know, the dragons they're going to have to be in the same army with. That would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? For the infantry to be around the dragons more. We're not gonna do that though. Why would we do that? That, that makes too much sense. Violet's like, where the fuck am I? Tiern says, the course humans wouldn't have to take if they would simply stay seated on their dragons known as RSC. So the seer training class makes an appearance. So they are in a room with eight infantry cadets and <laughs> it starts talking about how the infantry is all homogenous. And again, I don't really understand why the infantry all has to be homogenous and the scribes do, and assumedly the healers too, but the writers get to be special. Other than this is divergent fan fiction, and they do that to make it even more divergent fan fiction. The writers are dauntless, and they get to have tattoos and be super cool, and running around in black clothes all the time. And listen, um, I read uh, Divergent. I don't, I don't need to read it twice. I'm good. You could have made a new thing. Same dark blue uniforms, same boots, same everything, only their name tags about their hearts are different. Talks about how how they've all made modifications to their uniforms because they're riders. We know! You're the special special. Good for you. We aren't even wearing name tags. Ah yes, don't get me started on the name tags thing again. They are given water, they drink it, something's in it, and as soon as they drink it they realize that they are cut off from the bond of their dragon. And they're told there are times in your careers when you'll need someone you can trust in the air or on the ground and those bonds are forged here at Basgiath. When? Only in seer training? Why didn't we start this sooner? It would make a lot more sense to start it sooner. You're gonna have to work with scribes. You're gonna have to work with healers. You're obviously gonna have to work with infantry. Why don't we merge the classes? Oh, I know. Because then we would have less scenes of Violet and Zayden pretending to be enemies to lovers. And then we, we, we wouldn't have wasted time on that. We would have, you know, spent time on something that actually matters. Ooh, I'm getting a little spicy. I mean, wouldn't it, <laughs> it just makes more sense. Like, wouldn't it be a more cohesive military if we do this from the beginning? Combine at least classes such as Battle Brief, since you know, the infantry is also in battles. They might even actually be a little, like, more knowledgeable about it. We have to level the playing field a little bit. Infantry has been doing land nav since their first year, so naturally, they might be a little better at it than you. Yeah, no shit. Would have made a lot more sense to combine that class, eh? So there's two groups of them that are rider and infantry, rider and infantry, and they are both working against each other and against the clock. They're supposed to lean on the infantry's land nav expertise, and if they encounter a dragon, Dragon, the only people that are going to know how to deal with dragons are the dragon riders, which again, if we just combine classes, but whatever. And of course there's like rivalry between infantry and riders, which honestly I would have been interested in seeing way sooner. I wish that we would have been doing this from book one. Having rival rivalry between the different factions at this war college would have been a lot of fun to see. Jack Barlow, who was killed uh, by Violet, she brought a mountain down on him during war games in the last book and he was bullying the shit out of her and trying to kill kill her since literally day one. Well, during war games, um, he hurt Liam and then she ended up killing him and that's what actually brought her lightning powers out. So he's dead, wink wink. Never saw a body? I don't believe it. But his dragon shows up. It says that she roasts somebody and then she dips. I found out, come to find out, that the reason, she's an orange dragon and the reason why the blast book says things like oranges are the most predictable and I kept asking for like a, a reason for this, <laughs> like a world building reason. <laughs> and and um, somebody told me that apparently it was just supposed, supposed to be funny because it's supposed to be like about that, can we call it a stereotype, about orange cats, uh, where like orange cats are, are the most wackadoodle. Uh, that, that's supposed to be what we were doing with the, with the dragons. Orange dragons are like orange cats. 
so I didn't know. Apparently humor is just not my strong suit. <laughs> Chapter 15. There's a course second year that I can't tell you about other than to say it's hell. My only advice, don't piss off anyone else's dragon. Page 96, The Book of Brennan. They find out that the reason that they are fighting between the two of the, the two groups in, in their little group, because there's two groups of two, and they're fighting between the infantry and the riders in their group, and it turns out it's because they were given two different maps, which is actually kind of funny. Violet and Rhiannon finally talk to each other like actual friends, although I don't feel like we ever saw their relationship cultivated in the first place, unlike, you know, the constant scenes between Zayden and Violet. So somebody says to Rhiannon, I was just saying that this whole exercise is a little cruel, don't you think? Practicing torture, I get. La navigating land, I understand. Evading capture, sure. I'll even make an argument for having to learn what bugs are edible, but it's not like other dragons are waiting behind enemy lines to kill us. And Violet, instead of keeping her mouth shut because she's literally part of the rebellion now, doesn't think to hold her tongue and says, you'd be surprised. And Rhiannon says, what? And she's like, uh, I mean, we don't really know what's out there, do we? And Riddick, of course, always with the quips that I can't stand, says, hopefully not fire-breathing griffins, ha 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 ha. And of course, Rhiannon, it's like the way that she writes women being clever is really lazy because like, I, I, I understand that Rhiannon is supposed to be smart, but we could set her up in a way that actually makes her look smart rather than she figures out that Violet's hiding something because Violet couldn't keep her mouth shut and said, you'd be surprised what's out there. Come on now, have her pick up on clues, not Violet not being able to keep her mouth shut. And like, of course, Zayden doesn't trust you. Look what you do when you're left alone. Rhiannon's like, you know what's out there. You've been attacked by Griffin. So you do actually know what's out there, right? And Violet's like, right. Rhiannon says, something's going on with you. I haven't so much as seen Andarna since you returned. You're running around with Imogen of all people. You won't open up about whatever's going on with you and Zayden. You won't talk about war games. You might think that I don't notice you're pulling away from everyone, but I do. You barely eat with us. And every chance we get to sneak into Shantara, you're holed up in your room reading. So way to make it blatantly obvious that something's going on with you. Great shot, Violet. Good rebellion work. The rebellion continues to be a circus. They fail. <laughs> they fail their their first time at the course. They get uh, yelled at by the superiors. They are given water that has an antidote for cutting off their dragon bond. So they are finally reunited with their dragons. And they have a little bit more camaraderie with the infantry. Again, I wish we would have seen this sooner. And the infantry sees dragons again up close and they're like, you're going to have to get used to them. They'll be at outpost. You're all at stationed at once you take your commands after graduation. And I'm like, wouldn't it it be the most efficient option for the army to get everybody used to dragons so that they are not in a state of panic when they are on the front lines? Sure, sure thing. Apparently the drinking that thing that cuts off your dragon bond is a new development this year according to Tiern, one that Tiern does not care for. I could hear you, sense you, but you could not reply. She says, gods, I'm so tired. Why the hell would leadership be developing ways to weaken us? Ma'am, you are so stupid. You are so stupid. You can't think of a reason? You can't think of a reason why this empire who does not inform their population about a major threat would want to weaken you. If you're weak, you can be controlled easier. Duh. <laughs> Duh. Rhiannon tells her, I know you don't believe me, but I'm telling you that things are weird this year. There are guarded infirmary doors. They're developing elixirs to muffle our bonds. You were nearly assassinated at assessment. And I'm like, if Rhiannon is starting to understand these things, why can't Violet talk to Tiern and be like, hey, can you talk to Rhiannon's dragon and see if Rhiannon's cool and then we could just pull Rhiannon into this thing and if anything, her dragon can protect her? No, that's not an option? Okay, sure. Like, dragons already feel like humans are subordinate to them anyways, right? <laughs> so this is such an easy fix. We just have Rhiannon's dragon be like, all right, well, you have to do this thing for me because you are a puny human and you must do what I say. Like, like it, I feel like that's how Tyrn is. So why can't Rhiannon's dragon be the same? And Tyrn and, and her dragon must, I mean, I just, ah! And there's no way that her dragon would have bonded her if she thought she was a bad person, right? Because don't dragons go for somebody that they like? And I just, th none of this makes sense. Chapter 16. My dad hoped I'd go into the infantry like he did. He thought riders were pompous pricks and in his defense, we really are. Correspondence of Lieutenant Zayden Ryerson. She goes to see Jacinia again, the scribe, and asks, can I ask what book did Jacek, the guy that was killed in his own room, request that got him hauled away and killed? And Jacinia is like, I didn't realize he had gotten killed. And she said, yeah, a few days after we saw Colonel Markham, who's the scribe commander, take him. He was looking for an account of a border attack that doesn't exist. I told him there's no such records, but he came back three times, certain there was because he'd had family killed in the event. I recorded the request and sent it up my chain of command thinking it would help him. Violet says, last year, you didn't record when I asked for a 
book that doesn't exist in your records. Why? Jacinia. At first because I didn't want to be embarrassed that I couldn't find it. Then because I couldn't find it. We should have a copy of almost every tome in Navarre here. Yet you told me you'd read one that we don't have. And then I looked up Wyvern. And nothing. We have no recorded folklore like what you read. The book that her dad had been reading her. Violet says the title wasn't wrong. wrong. I found my copy which means our archives are incomplete. There are books in existence that we have no records of. And Jacinia is asked did you record any of the books that I asked for this year? And Jacinia said no. Despite the fact that if she's caught breaking re regulation she won't just be denied the adept path which is like the highest path for scribes. She'll be expelled from the college or worse. She's already risking so much on my account if she's telling the truth. And I'm like okay well this then should be the point where Violet realizes that this is the kind of thing that Zayden is trying to avoid. Why he did not tell her rebellion information and, on and only agreed to tell her personal information about himself because he's trying to avoid specific instances like this where Violet pulls other people and herself into danger. She didn't think to say to Jacinia, hey, please don't record the request despite Violet knowing that that would be a thing that would happen. What are you talking about? And Jacinia is horrified that the archives are incomplete either by ignorance or intention. So she tells Jacinia, I need the most comprehensive text you have about how the first six built the wards. But no one can know that I'm asking, that I'm research researching. My more than my life depends on it. The older the text, the better. She goes off to fighting class and Sloan, Myrie, who is Liam, the guy who died, the sister of Liam, is in her wing and she's learning to fight but she's terrible at it and so Violet tells her, uh, you need to learn to fight or you're gonna die. So I know you don't care about that but I have Liam's letters so if you want them you need to train to fight so that you save your life because Liam made me promise to keep you alive so I will give you a letter for each week that you train. And Imogen sees this and it's like, I see now why Zayden fell for you. You're clever, way more clever than I gave you credit for. I bet you keep him constantly annoyed. Uh, Violet is not clever, but she does keep me po constantly annoyed, so there's that. Her and Jacinia exchange books. She agrees to give Jacinia her copy of Fables of the Baron temporarily and Jacinia gets her some history text so she's looking over some history of both dragons and uh, the politics of the land that they live in. Then at the end of the chapter she and Tyrn um, go off to see Zayden but Zayden is at work on 24-hour duty so she's not even going to be able to see him. I'm sure we're all dying inside over this. Certainly I'm dead inside. Chapter 17. Many historians choose to ignore the sacrifices made by both humans and dragonkind to establish Navarre under the first wards in favor of praising the spirit of unification but I would be remiss not to mention the losses suffered both in terms of the ancestral hatching grounds of each dragon breed and the civilians who did not survive the continent-wide migration that resulted from opening Navari's borders or those we lost when we closed them. And this is from a book that assumedly Violet's reading. She says, Tyrn is going to the Imperium about Andarna, but absolutely nothing can be done until she wakes from the dreamless sleep anyway. I don't understand how this is even a problem. Uh, I, I, don't, I just don't understand the, the dragon politics in this at all. They're not explained and on purpose because if we explained them, then we would have glaringly obvious plot holes instead of mildly obvious plot holes. She says that she thinks that leadership is keeping her and Zayden apart as punishment for not producing Andarna, which is ridiculous. Why the dragons would, I mean, leadership has dragons so that the other dragons would know about this. So that's, that's ridiculous again. Zayden keeps sending her letters and at this point I want to tell you that we are 25% into the book. We have not seen Brennan, her brother, again. We will not see him at least up until chapter 22 where I'm cutting this video off and she never thinks about Brennan. She never thinks about the fact, wow, my brother is alive. I thought he was dead for the last six years. How has this informed who I am? How does this change who I am now? How does this change my relationship with my mom, my sister? How does this change my relationship with my dead dad? How does this change my relationship with the Empire? I'm living under. And how much does Zayden know about my brother that I could glean from? What could he tell me about my brother that would make me feel closer to my brother who I thought was dead because he knew my brother was alive the whole time? This is really going to affect my family when they find out. This is affecting me currently. How did he do this? How was he able to fake his death so successfully? Did, was anybody else I know involved in covering this up? How was this even possible? These are very, very, very basic things that should be addressed and we have not done so. 25% into this book. Instead, she is continuously doing, just like in the last book, the same thing over and over and over, where she's um, arguing with her non-boyfriend, excited about letters from her non-boyfriend, worried about Andarna, which doesn't make sense because the Imperium should be protecting her, and hiding stuff from her best friend and pissing that best friend off. We do the same thing over and over. Oh, and checking out books. 
Great. She argues with Imogen about Zayden and Imogen's like, we keep information classified all the time. You'd have the same problem with any writer you dated, which is a good point. And Violet says she has a point, but she's missing my point. Let's say that you're with someone and one day a battle axe come hur comes hurling out of his arm wire. And Imogen says, if you didn't think the man was hiding more than a few battle axes, then you're mad at the wrong person because you lied to yourself. That's a really good fucking point. And Imogen also says, you don't have to freeze out everyone you can't be completely honest with just because Ryerson says that works for him. It doesn't, hence all of your issues and it looks like your friends need you, so go. And I'm like, didn't we just say in the last chapter that Violet was clever? How did she not think of this herself? Rhiannon says, I got this letter um, from my parents this morning with this attached. They said that they're circulating, circulating this around the village, and it's a flyer that says, beware of strangers seeking shelter. In this time of unprecedented violations of our sovereign borders, we count on you, our border villages, to be our eyes and ears. Our safety depends on your vigilance. Do not take in strangers. Your kindness could kill. So they end up having to take these... Uh, the, these into account in their battle brief class and they have a conversation about propaganda which is so hilarious and just out of touch for Rebecca to write this and then to not see how much the United States engages in this, how much Israel engages in this, and then post the like both sides rhetoric that she does. It's just really like lacking in self-awareness. If this is the lack of self-awareness is is really it's sad honestly. It, it just makes me mad. So they're talking about propaganda. Today we're going to talk about the battles that aren't quite so obvious. One of your classmates received this notice. This is a regional notice which is why it doesn't carry a public announcement number, we have seen an alarming number of attempted border crossings. And while this conversation is happening, simultaneously Violet is reflecting on what she's been reading. Every book I've read mentions the glorious accomplishment, but none say how it was accomplished. If the answer is in the archives, then it's well hidden. So they start asking the first years about, in this class, about like the, the propaganda and uh, th they're not calling it propaganda, but I'm calling it propaganda. They're talking about the notice and they're saying, you know, okay, well, why is it important that we have our border? because we can't know their intentions. It's why we keep our borders closed. And Violet is thinking to herself, but when did we close our borders? As soon as we unified? And which parts of this were wiped from the history books? And instead, what's called propaganda is from the Paromio people, the Griffin writing people, Markham says. What's more disturbing is the propaganda these Paromish people bring with them. Falsified announcements from their own leadership of cities destroyed in what they claim to be violent attacks. And she's like, you fucking liar inside of herself. This notice does not mean we are without compassion. In fact, for the first time in hundreds of years, we authorized classified missions, now completed of course, to recon reconnoitre, recon reconnoitre, I don't know what that word is, those very cities. And she's getting so mad that Rhiannon looks at her and asks, are you all right? And I'm like, the fact that you can't keep your emotional emotions in check is exactly why Zayden does not trust you with classified rebellion stuff. She leaves class very upset and she's like, I'm going to be late for a seer training RSC, which I definitely don't understand how that's allowed, but whatever. And Rhiannon is like, like, that, that seems like a terrible idea, but okay. She goes to the scribe quadrant, busts into the scribe quadrant meeting, asks to talk to Jacinia. Jacinia is like, you, you need to come here on Saturdays or you're gonna get us caught. Like, literally says you're gonna get us caught and says, I'll meet you tonight at eight with new selections. Because Violet's like, I need more. I need to read faster so I can figure out this empire shit now. This is so, so stupidly written. Yeah, Violet's so clever. We were just told how clever Violet is and yet she's just made it blatantly obvious to tons of people that something is going on with her. Okay. Chapter 18. It is only when we push the wards to their true limits, extending them far past what we first thought possible and to what I now question as sustainable, that we define the borders of Navarre, regretfully knowing that not every citizen would benefit from their protection. The Journey of the First Six, a secondhand account by Sagar. She goes to see Zayden again and he's wearing his flight jacket, revealing the short sleeves of his summer uniform and indecently toned arms. Every time we describe something about Zayden, it's somethingly something indecently toned, breathtakingly beautiful, and on and on and on. I think I had Natalie make a list for me at one point. She says that she wants to have sex and he's like, those are not the words that I needed. I want you to tell me you love me and also why aren't your shields up? Why aren't her shields up? Because she's doing everything except what she was asked to do by the rebellion that she so desperately wants to be a part of. All I have to do is be honest with him about how I feel and I can have him, his body at least, but isn't that what I already had before? Ironic that it's my truthfulness that can put me out of my own misery when it's his candle or I crave. I guess in that way, we're alike, both wanting more than the other person is willing to risk. He's just not willing to risk other people. He's willing to be honest with you about himself, which is not something he was willing to do last year. I just, this is so manufactured. It's annoying. Oh, he came to see her this time. He's in her room and sees that she has a bunch of books. He's like, why are you researching the first six? And she says, 
is for the rebellion. And he's like, Brennan told you that we have a wardstone, didn't he? I'm going to fucking kill him. She says, why? Because he's more forthcoming with me than you are? Relax, it's not like he gave me your journal or something. And he says, I don't keep one, but that would have been far more preferable. Yeah, no shit, because you said that you would give her personal information, not rebellion information. Why are we having this conversation for the 15th time? Digging around for information on Navari's most classified defense will get you killed. And she's like, civilians are fleeing for our borders. No one in Navari knows the truth and Arisha needs to defend itself to protect its, the people I'm guessing you're prepared to take in when Venon inevitably reached Tyrandor. And she's like, you are going to take the people in, aren't you? He's like, yeah. So she says, okay, I'll keep researching until I figure out how the first six put these words in place so we can duplicate the process in Arisha. No one knows how it was originally done or how, only how to maintain them. So they don't know how to make... So they, they don't know how to, but I thought you just needed the, the, the smelted alloy. Oh, I'm so confused. He's like, where did you get all these books? She says, a friend. He says, there's a reason we don't fuck around in the archives. That's a beat, the beating heart of the enemy. We don't have any friends in there. And I'm like, this is the part where it would have made a ton of sense for you to recruit her way fucking sooner. She's the sister of the guy you're co-leading the rebellion with, whose dad also was the scribe who was doing a bunch of research. He trained Violet as a scribe. She knows a bunch of stuff. It would have made way more sense for you to recruit her sooner. She has all the scribe info. So he says, well, I want to go talk to Jacinia if you're going to go talk to Jacinia because she's supposed to go get books from Jacinia right now. He says, you have some loyal friends. She says, just remember you said that when it comes time to tell them what's going on under their noses. And I'm like, be so fucking for real, Rebecca. You never at any, ma any point made Violet friends with literally one single person who I think is going to betray Zayden or Violet. I, I don't think so. And it, it would have made sense to, because when you live like what like think about United States imperialism think of how ingrained that is in us and how we are taught to excuse literal war crimes we, we're taught to excuse them because we're um, bringing freedom to the globe and all this shit think of how hard it is to unlearn that some of you may not have even unlearned it I certainly didn't until I was in my late 20s at no point have we made it so that we see these people in like potentially her friends going through an arc of unlearning empire propaganda there's going to be a point of this book, mark my words, when all of her friends collectively, probably including Dane, are like told, hey, empire bad, and not even hesitation will happen. They will go with the rebellion because we don't do character work that actually makes three-dimensional characters here. So when it comes to the time for them to desert this bad military empire, not a single one of them is going to say, no, I'd rather be evil. And certainly not a single one of them is going to say, well, I need to do some unpacking of that empire propaganda. Like, <laughs> they're all going to turn immediately without hesitation. We already set up Rhiannon for it. We already, I mean, basically that's it. Like, it's Rhiannon and it's Dane and Nadine's dead. So th that's it. Like, we, we're not setting, we're not setting up to unpack empire propaganda. This is stupid. And then they have the fight again about her not being able to have information. You would never sit here and do nothing when you could help. Asking me to do differently is just insulting. I'm smart enough to handle myself in the archives. He says, I never said you weren't brilliant. I never even said your plan wasn't brilliant. I said you're putting yourself in danger and I'm just asking you to be honest with me. Oh my fucking god, I don't want to do this for 600 pages. And he says, Varish pushed you to a near fucking burnout, hyphenated again. Isn't that fun for me? And you didn't tell me that either. Or that you wielded in the middle of courtyard after battle brief because she was so mad, her power just unleashed. Definitely keeping it together. And he knows all this because his cousin Bodhi told him. They run into Nolan, who's the mender, so he is bonded to a dragon that gave him, much like Brennan, the power to mend, which is like magical healing. And he's not doing so hot, just like Rhiannon mentioned previously, and he's all backed up on work. He looks like a walking corpse, and it says, I suppose I could use some rest. It's hard work mending a soul. Been at it for months now. His smile lifts on one side, but I can't tell if he's joking or not. You've been well so far this year. I haven't been called to mend you. And I'm like, okay, that was just like a big ass hint. I've been mending a soul. Why would he joke about something like that? Okay, whatever. Apparently, Nolan is mending somebody's soul, and that's why he's so burnt out. She finally tells Zayden about the fables of the Baron, the folklore book that her dad left her that just magically does not have a copy in the archives and has talks about the venom and the wyvern because apparently the only person on earth who knows about this book just happens to be conveniently Violet Sorengale. So he finally, she finally tells him about this despite the fact that they've had ample opportunities to have this conversation and it's absolutely pertinent and he's mad that she loaned it to Jacinia. With that text she could have turned you in and if I report that she's not recording my requests she'll be at Markham's mercy, says Violet. Trust has to go both ways, meaning
mean anything. And he says, yeah, it goes both ways, but you're shutting me out while I'm trying my damnedest to open up to you. And honestly, that's true. And she's like, yeah, as long as you can keep your secrets, you could expect complete blind faith without giving it. It goes both ways, period, after every word. When I wake in the morning, the other half of my bed hasn't been slept in and his things are gone. Oh no, I'm devastated. Chapter 19. Dragons do not answer to the whims of men. Colonel Cowery's Field Guide to Dragon Kind. So it's in the Field Guide to Dragon Kind, but we're doing all this bullshit with Varish? Okay, this doesn't make any fucking sense. Literally opens with saying there's something off about that orange, referring to Varish's dragon. Just all the subtlety of a gun. Just all the sh fucking sh subtlety of a shotgun. Just ah! Varish shows up and to her, in, in front of her and says, there will be no maneuvers for you today, Soren Gale. I'm hereby charging you with dereliction of duty for your dragon's refusal to appear for maneuvers. You will mount and fly to your training location with Professor Carr to receive your punishment. And Tyrion says, that's not happening. There will be no punishment. It is not within your power to summon a dragon. <coughs> Quickly quickly, why didn't we have this conversation sooner? If the answer is to prolong this and cause drama so that we could just get here and have like a big, oh no, moment, go back to the drawing board. That's not a good reason. It's terrible. If I have to say it doesn't make sense this many times, clearly something is wrong and we need to hurry right. You need to have a good reason for why things happen. Otherwise, I mean, we could just throw like a literal woolly mammoth is in charge of the Dragon College now. Why? I, I don't know. We don't have to have a good reason. See how stupid that sounds? God, that was the worst example. Your dragon may not fall under my command, Soaring Gale, but you do, so unless you'd like to further explore that delicate space between burnout and death, you will mount and pre present yourself. Taren stalks forward, says, and Darna does not answer to you. I do not answer to you. She thinks, oh shit, this could go bad very quickly. Um, yeah, he could just eat him. The end. He threatens to do it all the time. What difference, literally, what difference would it make? What would happen? I, I'm genuinely asking, what would happen if Taren eats somebody? I don't think he'd get in trouble. What, what would what happened? The fact that I don't know is a little sad. Varish says, but you answer to me. And Tyrion says, does she? And locks his jaw around Solus, the orange dragon that belongs to Varish, the, the throat of Solus. And Solus is fucking bleeding. And she says, what will the Empyrean do to him if he kills Solus? This is a great question. It's a great question. I wish we'd answered it. Only a writer can be the vice commandant of Basgiath, Tyrion warns, and Solus lets out a sound that's half roar, half shriek. Without a dragon, you are no rider. Fine, Varish shouts. She will not pay a price for her dragon's refusal to attend. Taryn says, not good enough. This is about you. I think what's happening is that Tyrion is saying this to Solus and Solus is saying it to Varish because you can't talk to a dragon that you're not bonded to. All right, Varish staggers forward. All right, keep putting his hands up. Humans have no authority to summon dragons. And Taryn demands that Varish apologize on his knees to Violet. I am sorry. It is not in my authority to summon in any dragon. Varish stares at me with a hatred so bitter I can taste it on the back of my tongue as Solus launches behind him with a roar aimed in my direction, or Tairn's, leaving behind pools of blood on the grass below. Problem solved, says Tairn. <laughs> I mean, I think it would have been solved if you would have just eaten him. She talks to Rhiannon and Rhiannon talks about how uh, bleak it feels at the Dragon College and how they're th them weeding out the weaker folks using the gauntlet is inhuman. And Violet's like, no, as much as I hate to admit it, admit it, the gauntlet has its place here. Don't do the Empire's work for them. Don't do that. Are you stupid? What's wrong with you? Rhiannon says, I just don't think it's worth the, the lives that it costs. Most of what happens here is it. It is, says Violet. Okay, sure. You weren't there when Orly fell. Is there any part of you that thinks she would have been a liability? Oh my god, Violet, why are you doing the Empire's work for them? And Rhiannon's like, what happened out there with Liam? What, like, why don't you just tell me? She says, you don't want to know. I really do. It's just us out here. Talk to me. And Violet's like, I'm running because I feel like if I don't, I'm going to be next. You don't know what it's like out there, Re. You can't understand. We are the weapons and this place is the stone they use to sharpen us. Oh, Oh, Violet, you are really starting to piss me off. Chapter 20. In the years after my father died, I forgot what it felt like to be loved. Then I entered the quadrant and became the monster everyone needed me to be, and I never regretted it. But then you gave those words to me, and I remembered, and nearly lost you too. I'm striving to be better for you, just like I promised. But I need to know that monster is still there, screaming to use every ruthless part of me to get your words back. Respond correspondence from Violet, from Zayden to Violet, who fucking cares? Violet and Tiern have been arguing for hours about whether or not she can attempt a running landing. And Tyrion is like, no, we're not doing that. And she says, you can't change graduation requirements. And my question is, 
because, I mean, why the fuck not? Humans can't command dragons. If Tyrion refuses to attempt it, what are they gonna do? If he refuses to let his rider do it, what are they gonna do about it? How's she gonna force him? This doesn't make sense. She goes to see Zayden and he says, tell me to kiss you even if it's just for show. And I don't really understand why this happened, but basically he made her make out with him so that Mira wouldn't ask her to spend the night in her room because now Mira's stationed there. I don't really understand this scene at all, but we get a long explanation about them making out. I part my lips under his and immediately regret every second I've spent not kissing him lately. This is everything. The energy thrumming in the air around us pales in comparison to the power that floods my veins, the need that ignites within me as we both work to control the kiss. A bunch of fucking paragraphs to describe them making out, which obviously, you know, made me want to pop my eyes out with a spoon. Put my sister down, Ryerson. You made your, vo you made your point. I want to remind you that we are 31% in now and we could not have seen um, this sister whose shared brother is still alive, by the way, uh, any sooner than this because we have been too busy having the same conversations with the same three people over and over and over about the same things. Wanting to see Varish, wanting to see the baby dragon, and Zayden and Violet not getting along because he doesn't want to give her rebellion secrets, and Rhiannon and Violet not getting along because she doesn't want to give her rebellion secrets. And because of that redundancy in a 650 page book, we have not been able to see the sister yet. Isn't that great? So he takes her bags to his room while she hangs out with Mira and he's and it randomly says maybe he's actually taking two of those bags to a drop point and leaving with Mira me with Mira to distract me I hate that I can't trust him my good bitch what the fuck are you talking about why the fuck would he do that what are you talking about. I'm getting squeaky. So her and Mira decide to go throw knives at stuff because millennials. And she says in her own head, Brennan is alive. Brennan is alive. Brennan dot is dot alive dot. It's all I can think is we empty our sheaths into the wooden targets that line the back of the outpost's small sparring gym. Yes, it only took you 30% through this book to remember that your dead brother is actually alive and that your sister might be affected by that information. Great job. Super clever. Violet. And Mira's like, by the way, you being with Zayden is fraternizing with an officer. I mean, what else would you be fraternizing with since there's not enlisted? <laughs> this is so silly. Mira warns her, hey, RSC is extremely dangerous. You won't notice, but the, that's like the second highest way that people die. When they're riders in Basgiath War College, you won't notice, but the death toll just creeps up during RSC basically. And then Violet asks her, why are you stationed here in Samara? It's warded and you're already a walking shield. So this is kind of a waste of your signet power because if we remember Mira's power is that she basically takes shields with her she amplifies them and I'm like a fucking minute why didn't we just ask Mira to join the rebellion her brother's not dead her brother could show up and be like listen here's what's really happening let's get on our dragons I'll fly you out we'll see the venom you'll see that mom's lying you'll see the empire's lying and then you agree to help ward. You, you are a ward. You help bring borders and border security. Oh God. So if you could protect people from these venom, that would be great. Why did we not even consider that? Further, I'm still con considering like why we didn't just steal, like they, they need that luminary in order to make the dragon fire melt the alloy. Why aren't they just making plans to steal it? Like we couldn't have had a heist. We're doing the same conversations multiple times instead of planning a heist. God, what a waste. Why didn't I think about asking her about the ward sooner. Maybe the answer isn't in a book. Maybe it's in Mira. After all, her signet is the ability to extend the wards. Uh, why didn't you ask? Because you are the least astute bitch on the planet. That's why. Mira explains that the wards sort of work like an umbrella. The ward stone is the stem. The wards take the shape of a dome over Navarre. Oh, like an iron dome? Okay. But just like an umbrella's spokes are the strongest of the stem, by the time the wards reach the ground, they're too weak to do much without a boost. And the boost is provided by the alloy. It's the alloy stored in the outpost that tugs some of those umbrella spokes forward, extending the, the wards twice as far as they'd normally be able to reach in some cases. And so Violet asks, okay, but how do you weave new wards? Like if we wanted to protect places outside the wards like Athbean, and Mira says, you don't. So I'm once again confused. Uh, I guess this magic system is just above my head. Do you know how a ward stone works? No, I don't. And she looks around, she's like, could you be cautious before people start listening into this conversation? But of course not, because Violet doesn't think about you know, having secure conversations. <laughs> She's really stupid. She starts asking her sister about the reports of Peromish citizens coming across the border. And she says, do you trust those reports? And Mira says, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't you? And then Mira starts to get suspicious and says, tell me what's going on with you now. And she's like, what if the things that we've been seeing that you've been seeing across the border aren't dragons? What if they're wyvern? What if they 
are destroying Peromish citizens uh, cities since we both know that dragons wouldn't be destroying Peromish cities. What if there's an entire war out there we know nothing about? So she basically just handed her sister a bunch of information and her sister is also stupid because her sister's like, what are you talking about? How silly! She then tells Zayden, you're right not to trust me because I almost told her. I even hint hinted hoping she'd catch on. So basically you did tell her, it's just she was too stupid to understand. Got it. Everybody's stupid. But this is actually kind of cute. So Zayden is from Tyrandor, which has a different culture than the Empire. The Empire took over and sort of erased both their language and their culture. But she speaks Tyrish, he speaks Tyrish, and he also gives her a book of how to tie certain Tyrish knots, which is really honestly kind of cute. If I didn't hate everything else in this book, this would be a point in its favor. So she, he's like, I gave you the book in case you're interested in, in, in exploring an aspect of Tyrish culture. I can weave every knot in the book. It'll be fun to see if you can keep up with me. If I couldn't, if I could stand these characters, I would think that this was a lot cuter, but it's only mildly cute because I really hate them. <laughs> she asks him, what is alloy, the metal, made out of? And he says, an amalgamation of taladium, a few other ores, and dragon eggshells. Dragon eggshells are metal and they still carry magic long after dragons hatch. Eggs being made of metal is a little weird, but you know what? It's also kind of cool, so I'll allow it. <laughs> Especially since, like, the shells contain magic. For once, I don't have a complaint about this. Chapter 21. Two more, y'all. Two more. She starts to, like, learn the, to tie the knots out of the book that uh, Zayden taught her, told, gave her, which is, it's cute. I just wish I didn't hate these people. She finds out that another person that they were out and about with when the wyvern attacked got murdered. There's no logical way an attack would be used to cover up a single death, right? Because he got killed in an attack. I just, how are you this aloof about how evil your empire is? I, okay, sure. We get a lot of history information because we are in class and it talks about um, a land called Cygnuson being absorbed into the kingdom of Peromio, which is where the Griffin Riders come from, where they've been for the last 300 years. History and current events are tied because one influences the other. In case anyone ever tells you reading is not political, uh, reading is always political because you are influenced by your environment and your environment is influenced by history. Everything is connected. There is no such thing as pure individualism. Please read Angela Davis. Peromio's provinces maintain their individual cultural identities, which is not something that happens in her land, she says, as opposed to our provinces who unified under the protection of the first wards, chose the common language and blended the cultures of all six provinces into one cohesive kingdom. And her teacher actually, actually asked good questions, which of course people on the right would say, well, these are very politically leading questions. Navari chose the common language, but who was it common to? It was common to one group and that meant that Tyrandor, which is where Zayden's from, Moraine and the Lucerus provinces lost their languages. The teacher asked, what was sacrificed in unification? Someone answers, we are safe here, but we're not welcomed beyond our borders. Well, yeah, you guys are a fucking empire. No shit. <laughs> One girl who has a rebellion relic says that we lost major parts of our culture, not just our language, but our songs, our festivals, our libraries, everything in Tyrish had to be changed. The only unique thing we kept are our runes because they're in too much of our architecture to justify changing. This is cool. I didn't realize that the Tyrish runes were unique to Tyrandor and that they are part of their uh, their infrastructure. That's cool. I just wish we had explored it more because I like the idea of it. I love the idea of a written magic, but we don't do anything with it, which is really disappointing. Why are you introducing I like when you don't do thing with thing I like. If you're looking for a written hard magic, please look no further than the Lachlan series. My god, so, so good. Like, it's actually like you have to write out the magic in order for it to work on things. It's so cool. Violet thinks that we only gave people outside of Navari one year before we closed our borders, and if you couldn't afford to move your family, couldn't risk the treacherous journey, well, too bad. Like, and that sucks. And that's the cost of doing imperialism. And the teacher says, the question we must all ask ourselves as we enter services is, are our sacrifices worth it to keep the citizens of Navarre safe? And the majority of people say, everybody in the room says yes, and Violet says nothing. This is a conversation that I have actually liked in this series so far. It does a decent job explaining what is lost when we do imperialism and force assimilation, but also this is very self-unaware considering Rebecca's takes on certain things. Then we go back to terrible writing with uh, the words fun times being used and Riddick saying, I'm in the mood to kick some ass. 
Yes, so great. We finally, finally, we are in chapter 21 and we finally see the king's son again. Been a while, eh? Why even introduce him, huh? My God, the beginning of this book is a disaster. We're 35% into this book and she has not had a literal conversation with the king's son since the first time she saw him. The king's son who's dipped out on his dad to go join the rider's quadrant that he wasn't supposed to join. But wait, first, we're not gonna talk to the king's son. We're gonna talk to Dane. Remember Dane? God, me too. Dane shows up and is like, hey, we have to talk because you're avoiding me and I don't like it. And since she won't talk to him, he challenges her to a fight because that's within his rights as wing leader during the fighting class. This is another class, again, that they could have just had with infantry. There's no reason to split up the two, but that's neither here nor there or anywhere in this book for that matter. Anyway, we're not actually going to talk to the king's son first. First, we're going to argue with Dane because if we recall, Dane took her memory and told his dad about it and she assumes that Dane was in on the idea to send them off to their death. And he tells her, tells her that when he stole her memory, it was when Ryerson told her that he had been running off to Athbean with his cousin Bodhi. Second years don't get kind of get get leave for that kind of flight, so I told my father. And she's like, "Yeah, but you said I'll miss you when I le when I left." And he's like, "Yeah, I meant like I'll miss you because you were choosing him," which was very obvious to me, the reader, but somehow not obvious to our very clever main character Violet. And he's like, "You know about the scars on his back? The reason I think he hates you is because the scars on his back, your mom put him there." Which like I feel like didn't we know about this or couldn't we have assumed from context clues? Violet had once again in history class let something slip again about assassinations in front of Rhiannon and Rhiannon said I heard what you said in history you know you said something about assassinations and Rhiannon said who else besides Mason is dead that went to Athbean with you like you just led her right to it my god subtlety of a gun you were attacked on assessment day Imogen's been targeted twice since parapet so were Bodhi and Aya who the fuck is Aya Dane has one of those classified signets what did he steal from you Violet god she's putting it together too quickly she's also owed as much of the truth as I can give her and I trust you implicitly but not every secret is mine to tell. Bitch, you have been arguing with Zayden about the same shit. Either you are the stupidest bitch on earth or you just blatantly have double standards. What the fuck? Rhiannon says, Dane stole one of your memories and now you think the other writers with you during war games are being picked off. Stop, I beg her. Do us both a favor and just stop. You saw something you weren't supposed to, didn't you? What dot killed dot J, which is Liam's dragon. Don't ever ask me that question again. Please don't make me lie to you. She does talk to the prince now and he says, where does your father think you are? He thinks I'm on my 20th birthday tour. We are 35% in. I cannot believe we're doing this now. You're just now asking what? She doesn't even think about Or being there. Like, doesn't even think about him. His real name's Cam. Doesn't even think about Cam being there. Just like, oh, yep, the prince is here. Guess we'll deal with that at some point. 35% in? Are you kidding me? And he had heard her conversation, I guess, with Rhiannon. And he says, she's catching on, isn't she? And Violet says, catching on to what exactly? He says, they haven't hidden it all away as well as they think they have. It's easy to figure out if you know what you're looking for. For. Personally, it was the daggers my guards started to carry that kit tipped me off. The ones with the little metal discs. The guards were the hardest to slip to. They won't tell my father they've lost me until they absolutely have to. I'm just hoping it's after threshing. He can't do shit after threshing. Dragons don't even answer to kings. Dragons don't even answer to kings. Dragons don't even answer to kings. Just want y'all to remember that. She says, you know, don't you? As in about the wyvern and venom and the uh, and, and the empire doing fuck shit. And he says, why else would I be here? Uh, to get a dragon. What the fuck? Chapter 22. She's having a nightmare about the venom and the wyvern and it said the distended veins spider webbing across his temples and cheeks so now we're using spider webbing but last time we used spidering and again I just can't get past the idea of a spider jumping around somebody's face I guess last time she did mean spider webbing but all right Zayden and her are reunited at Basgiath and they decide let's go down to the forge to see about you know the this is so stupid they're gonna go see about the wardstone just to you know ponder see what they can find out. The fact that this has never occurred to Zayden to do before in his, you know, three years at the War College. Okay, sure. But on their way there, they get interrupted by Major Barish. Zayden puts up a wall of shadows between them, which again, I don't know how shadows create a... a it's not really been explained how they like also create like solid material. I just wish I understood his magic a little better. And Varish is like, well, she has to come with me whether you like it or not because she's not on leave, you are, and uh, you're not under my chain of command, but Violet is, as I had to remind her dragon. I'd hate to, for her to have to repeat her disciplinary ses session just to skip out on a lesson on uh, with Lieutenant Grady, so it's time for her to go. And unfortunately, this means that Violet is about to go get tortured for the first time because we're doing seer training some more. So, okay. And that's it. That's where we 
leave off is that Zayden and Violet are being separated while Violet goes to get tortured for school. Oh my god, this was... <laughs> So much, so much. How many times did I say I don't understand or that doesn't make any fucking sense? I don't even know how to wrap this up. That was 35%, a little over 35% of a book that um, has done absolutely basically nothing so far. There is no reason for this to be 640 pages. That is an ungodly amount of pages to repeat yourself over and over, to make your character so stupid, to make her have blatant double standards, have this pointed out to her a couple times and not, you know, get the fuck over it. Everything with Dane is ridiculous. Everything with her forgetting about her brother until it's convenient for her to remember her brother is ridiculous. Her forgetting about her dad and all of his research is so convenient. Her being the convenient part of this rebellion is ridiculous. Her relationship with Zayden is ridiculous. Her relationship with everybody is ridiculous. They only serve to create drama and scenes. This is not like an organic creation of people. This is just stupid. It feels so manufactured, like, just like little, doing little puppets. It's honestly exhausting to read. Um, somebody asked me, is this one worse than the last last one. If you asked me right this second, I would say yes. If you asked me a few days ago, I would say they're the same. It's just more shit. It's just bad. It's just bad writing. Um, I have seen a lot, by the way, of people being like, it is so misogynistic. Y'all are dealing with so much internalized misogyny for hating on fourth wing just because it's written by a woman. I don't know who the fuck you're talking to because that can't be about me. This is just, I mean, I pointed out so many times, basic questions not being answered. I don't care who the fuck wrote it. If if I have this many basic questions not getting answered, the problem is not my internalized misogyny, which honestly is a problem that all of us deal with and, and sure, I have to work on sometimes, I admit that, um, but that's not what's at play here. What's at play here is bad writing. We can't just throw around internalized misogyny every time somebody doesn't like a book that we like. That's really stupid and also like creates confusion around what that term actually means, which is one of my pet peeves of people dealing with other people and people debating amongst each other. All this to say, it's not a good book in my opinion. It's not a well-written book. It's an overwritten book. It's not doing any sort of theme well. It's not doing any character arcs well. It's blatantly obvious. It's whole, it's, it's hand-holding all of its readers to the point of being, I don't even know how to describe this. I'm hand-holding to the point of being just gross. Like it's just stupid. Can you tell I don't have any notes? <laughs> I really do not like this. Um, I will finish it. You guys seem to like these and um, obviously this is my job. So, you know, I gotta I gotta pay bills and stuff. I'm gonna have to pay freaking buku money because I put my kids in childcare today. So I need to make back some of the income anyway. But my God, at what cost? I don't understand. Why is it like this? Why does it have to be written like this? I'm just tired. Um, it, these are exhausting to read. It shouldn't be exhausting to read a romanticy. It should be fun, but I should have my basic questions answered and also um, they shouldn't be overwritten. 640 pages? Are you kidding me? 640 pages for what? For what purpose? It seems to be, and I'll probably talk about this when I actually finish the book, It's I've only read the beginning what like three times now. It seems to be that the case that most people who read Fourth Wing and loved it didn't love Iron Flame and I think that the the high sort of wore off which sucks. I feel bad because uh, I was a little bit vicariously living through the people who did love it. My one of my best friends really enjoyed it <laughs> and I liked hearing how much she enjoyed it. We even did a book club at BookNet Fest for this book and while I didn't love it, other people did and I was like, I was yeah, I was uh, siphoning their joy. It, it's sad that this book sort of let all those same people down. I feel bad because man, y'all y'all deserved that. <laughs> I mean, it's not gonna happen for me either way because man, this is not my jam, but oh man, I feel, I feel bad at how much of a letdown this book seems to be for its actual fans. So, all right, that was it. That was fourth wing part one part two will be up eventually part three will be up eventually i just need the spoons in order to do them this is a huge amount of work i have had to well first of all my kids are on spring break so this is and carlos is out of town so yikes uh, i have a lot going on um so i've had to dedicate all of my, my work time to this one specific project when i have like a bunch of other things that i want to be working on but this is just so much and like the editing of these videos is so much and i just <laughs> this takes up all, all my time so uh it'll it'll probably be a couple couple months before we do part two. I am splitting this up uh, into three parts again. This has more chapters than the last book. This has 66 chapters, whereas I think the last one had 47. So we're splitting it up by 22 chapters instead of 13, I think we did the last time. So it's a lot. It's even more work than last time. My God, please, Rebecca, as a personal favor to me, please, can you edit and cut down on your chapters? Jesus fucking Christ. I'm hoping that this video won't be more than two and a half hours long. So future Rachel's probably like, shut the fuck up, bitch. 
All right, I think that's it. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for being here. If you made it this far, put a little dragon emoji in the comments. I appreciate y'all. Thank you for all your support. Looking forward to doing the series where I do comparison videos between this and other dragon books. So stay tuned for that because I am working on video one of that and more to come. Okay, all right. Thanks so much for watching. Leave your comments and questions below if you have any. And oh my God, I need to eat something. All right, okay, bye. Oh my God, I am so glad to be done. Y'all have no idea how glad I am to be done with this video. <laughs> I'm so tired of talking about this. I'm so tired of editing this book. That's really what, what this video, that's really what took the longest here is having to edit this was just an ungodly amount of time. I am so, so happy to be done. And before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons. And those are Alexander, Brittany Bobitney, Cammy, Choco's Waiting for Not All Men podcast, <laughs> Chris, DJ Rogdibus, Ellie, Emperor's New Blues, Aaron with two E's, Eric, Ethel Go Lightly, Galaxy Bot, JC Murphy, Jack, Jess, Jesse, Jill, John E, Julie D, Kelly No K, Casey McKenzie, Kate W, Caitlin M, Quinn, Lady Kitty Bug, Lemon Jelly, Lex, Lily B, Max B, Mixer Boneless, Alice, Panoramic, Panoramic Demon. Oh man, wow, that was that was a mouth exercise. Rachel C, Rain, Reese, SJ, Samar, Scarlet, Shadow Auntie, Shiny. SMK, Spoopy, Steph, Two Orbit, Chai Guy, and The Salem T. Lynn. Thank you all so much for being here and for being a friend. I'm so, so glad this is done. I'm so glad. So thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. And last but not least, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Starch Marxist patrons. And those are Alicia, Amanda, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley, Ava, Ballads and Bookends, Beth, Blake Lemon Pants, Blythe, Bookish Bats, Bookish Brain Rot, Brie, Caitlin, Cardinal Ginger, Carlin. Also, if you can hear any sort of dragon ball stuff going on in the background of this right now i'm so sorry but my kid's home sorry carlin casper kate w Catherine, kathy chris cj clementine cole colleen corwin cosmic danielle Darren, Deborah, Diet Goth, Dilf Enthusiast, Dorian, Dorotea, Ebby, Ember, Emerald Dodge, Emily A, Emily L, Emma, Aaron, Ezra Moon, Fiona, Gadarn, you're gonna have to tell me how to say that, I'm sorry, Hannah C, Harvey Kiro, Haley, Ilianaka, India Inks, JM Tenet, Jay is on Olympus, Jelly V, Jen Michelle, Gender Queer, Jenny G, Jessica Sue, Jillian, Jojo Bookish, Kai, Kat, Catherine, Katie, Kayala, Kendra, Kiara, Laughing Cat Dog, Laura G, Lauren G, Lazarus Ray, Library of Scars, Lindsay M, Lisa B, Lisa L, LP Aldiver, Lou Siri, Lustful Octopus, Martin, MV Marlowe, Madison, Man Eating Plant, Marcella, Marquita, Malara, Mentally Unwell, May, MK Books, Molly, James, Natalie, Never, Nicole G, Nicole R, Nyan Binary, Paige P, Penny Schilling, Fox Glove, Rachel B, Reba, Rebecca, Rivi, Ronnie, Rosie Thorns, Rowan, Sicoria, Sadie Selby, Sayer Riley, Sakia Lume, Samantha O, Sarah H, Sarah the Bay, Sarah Z, Shamed, Shannon, Sheen Onion, Sean, T. Delegati, Tay, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tiana, Toast, Trash Can Teddy, Ty, Title Phoenix, Wiki Cherry, and Writer A. Thank you all so much for being here and for being a friend. Mm -hmm.